Basket Hound by Scott S. Phillips. Oral Hamlin stared up at the night sky, wondering if the flying monkey would ever come back. This was his favorite part of the day, round about 2 a.m. when it came time to empty the spittoons. They reeked, of course, from the rotten toothed spit of a hundred cowboys and cheap chewing tobacco. On occasion, a drunk would piss in one rather than stagger out back to the outhouse, and the stink got a hell of a lot worse when someone had puked in one of them. But even that, Oral could live with, because being the designated dumper of spittoons meant he got to go outside by himself. Mr. Tevens didn't much let Oral go outside on his own otherwise, day or night. Oral carried a lantern in one hand and a spittoon in the other. It was black as hell out there, and he didn't want to fall in that trench again. Some nights, when the moon was real bright, he didn't need the lantern, but bringing it meant he had to make four trips to empty the spittoons, and he was happy for every one of them. Early on, right after Oral was given the task as a responsibility Mr. Tevens felt he could handle, the saloon's bartender, a one-eyed, crotchety son of a bitch named Branlin, insisted he dump all the spittoons into a big bucket and carry that out. One trip. Easy and done. Oral consistently made a point of spilling the contents of the spittoons while dumping them into the bucket, and Branlin eventually gave up on the idea. Oral suspected Mr. Tevens had caught on to his scheme, but the older man never mentioned it. When it came time to dump the chamber pots from upstairs, though, Oral didn't bring the lantern. He didn't much enjoy taking the chamber pots out, and with one in each of the upstairs rooms, except for Mr. Tevens' office, Oral wanted it over with as quickly as possible. Oral was 17 years old and had been with Mr. Tevens since he was 8, when Oral's daddy beat him senseless and he pretty much stuck that way. It was just after the war, and Mr. Tevens had come west minus a leg, but full of big dreams looking to make his fortune in the liquor and whore trade. He was literally stepping off the train when he saw Oral trip and fall in the mud, doing great disservice to his best clothes, but nothing to incur the sort of whipping his daddy unleashed as a result. Mr. Tevens hop-stepped on his wooden leg into the middle of the dust-up and threw a beating on Oral's daddy that left the man with a limp of his own, not to mention a busted-up face that would ensure he'd remember what he'd done every time he looked in the mirror till the day he died. The beating also did wonders for Mr. Tevens standing in the town, since no one much liked Oral's daddy and felt it was a long time coming. Tevens had purchased the stone house, which Oral thought was funny since the place was made out of wood, the larger of the town's two saloons, and the only one that came equipped with prostitutes and Branlin. Tevens moved into one of the upstairs rooms, and when Oral wandered into the joint a few days later, his daddy having run off in the night, Tevens took him in. Oral's room was basically a closet at the end of the hall with a cot in it, but he lived there happily ever since. What you gazing at, kid? Oral jumped, slopping some of the spittoon's contents onto the ground. Standing a dozen or so yards away was a man, watching him. Oral raised the lantern, trying to get a better look, but the light refused to cooperate, as if it were sliding off the figure. Who's that there? Oral asked, voice unsteady. Ain't scared, are you? No, Oral lied. After a moment, the man walked towards Oral. When he was a few feet away, the light from the lantern took hold, illuminating his features. Whip thin, about five and a half feet tall. Oral was relieved to see the man was shorter than him, clad in dusty gray trousers, stained shirt with frilled cuffs, and a black leather vest. His bowler hat was tilted far back on his head, like he was walking away from it, and it was struggling to keep up. Unlike the rest of his clothing, his boots were new, but covered in dust. His eyes were close together, deep-set, and focused on Oral in a way that made him uncomfortable, like he was in trouble for something. The man's lips pulled back in a smile that bunched up the weathered skin on the sides of his face like a wash rag being wrung out. Name's Malcolm. George Malcolm. Malcolm George Malcolm, Oral thought. First name same as the last. No, that ain't right. He just said it funny as all. George Malcolm. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Malcolm. Oral went to stick out a hand, realized they were both full, then settled on a nod towards the man. My name's Hamlin. Oral Hamlin. 
Why are you out here in the night with a cuspider full of Christ knows what, son? Just spit and chew is all, Oral said, taking a quick look to be sure. It's my job, one of them. Malcolm cocked an eye at Oral. You some kind of simpleton? No, sir. Took an injury as a boy. Somewhat scrambled my brain. You sound like a simpleton. Oral frowned. No, sir. Setting the lantern down on the ground, he upended the spittoon over the trench he'd dug a few days prior. The foul-smelling stew of saliva and tobacco, and as Malcolm pointed out, Christ knows what, spattered into the thicker sludge in the bottom of the trench. I have a job, and I do okay for myself, I reckon. He straightened, fixing Malcolm with a stern gaze. Didn't mean no offense, son. This job of yours? I'm guessing it's in a saloon or some other joint serves liquor? Yes, sir. The stone house. Not a hundred paces from where we stand now. Mind if I walk with you? Oral puzzled on it for a moment. Again, I meant no offense, Malcolm said, bowing slightly, and I could sure stand to pour some whiskey into myself. No, it ain't that, Oral said. Just that Brandlin's closing up the bar about now. I don't think he'd turn away your business, though. Malcolm made a sweeping gesture toward the nearby buildings. Then if you're finished pouring out your slop, by all means, lead the way, son. Oral started back to the stone house, Malcolm falling into step next to him. After a few paces, Oral glanced at the man, catching the tail end of an odd expression that sent something wriggling up Oral's spine to settle coldly at the base of his skull. The only time he'd felt anything similar was when his daddy was about to go on a tear. Ain't my place to pry what with us having just met and all, Mr. Malcolm, but I was wondering why you'd be out walking in the desert late at night like this. Malcolm took so long to answer, Oral thought he hadn't heard the question and was about to ask again when the man finally spoke. Guess I got lost just a little bit. Was on my way from Bell's Creek. Oral wanted to press him further, but they'd reached the back door of the stone house and Malcolm took the opportunity to steer things in a different direction. How many in there, son? Yourself included. Oral hung the lantern on a hook near the back door. Just a few, plus the whores, and some or all of them might be with customers. He made to open the door, but Malcolm's hand darted out, grabbing the handle. You know that ain't no real answer, don't you, boy? Malcolm said, making another of his fancy gestures as he opened the door to allow Oral in. Oral gave Malcolm a confused look as he stepped past him, entering a narrow, dark hallway. Lamplight from the saloon's main room spilled in at the other end. There's the three of us plus four whores and whatever men they's with, Oral said. We got two girls wait tables, but they gone home a while ago. Malcolm stepped into the hall, closing the door behind him. Fine, let's have that drink. Oral led the way down the hall into the main room of the saloon its dozen or so tables empty at this late hour. To their right was a staircase to the upper floor. On the left was the bar, an L-shaped counter with wooden stools running the length of it. Liquor bottles topped the shelves behind the bar, and a carefully lettered sign read, Tabs for liquor only, not whores. Branlin, looking 600 years old but meaner than hell, a puckered scar where his left eye had been, wiped the bar with a towel that looked as unpleasant as he did. His gray hair hung stringy past his shoulders, and his cheeks, trenched with age, were covered in salt and pepper stubble. His single eye settled on Oral and Malcolm, and he stopped wiping to stare at them. "'What's this you brung in?' Branlin said. "'Found him out back,' Oral said. "'He was hoping he could get a drink.' "'Or two, Malcolm said, stepping up to the bar and proffering a hand. "'Malcolm. George Malcolm.' "'He done it again,' Oral thought. Branlin's eye looked at the hand, then at Malcolm's face. He wiped his hand right with the bar towel and shook with him. Well, Mr. Malcolm, technically we's closed for business, but I think we can accommodate you, if you got money, of course. A pocketful, Malcolm said, stepping up and resting his elbows on the bar. Whiskey, please. Don't care how cheap or how shitty. We don't serve shitty whiskey in this joint. Malcolm turned his head to find Mr. Tevens coming down the stairs, stepping with his good leg, then swinging the wooden one after. With the saloon closed, he'd taken off the jacket, but still wore the rest of his favorite white suit, the vest unbuttoned. Tevens was about 35, probably handsome if you gave him half a chance, black hair slicked back and long sideburns, neatly trimmed. That's what I like to hear, Malcolm said, removing his hat and setting it on the bar. 
Oral set the spittoon down in its place at the end of the bar and started for the next one, midway along not far from where Malcolm was leaning. Branlin poured a shot of whiskey and pushed it toward Malcolm as Tevens reached the bottom of the stairs. Malcolm lifted the glass. Lose that leg in the war? Infection took it, Tevens said. Injury itself weren't too bad. Malcolm raised the glass as if to toast. Ain't you a fine trio? Short a leg, an eye, and a brain. He knocked back the shot, swallowing hard. Ain't polite to make light of those showing you hospitality after hours. Teven said. Apologies, Malcolm banged the glass down on the bar and looked at Branlin. How about another of those? Branlin looked past him at Teven's, who nodded. Branlin filled the glass. So what's your story, Mr. Malcolm? Like I was telling your chambermaid here, I got lost on my way from Bell's Creek. Walking, Oral said. And I ain't a chambermaid. He picked up the spittoon, careful to get a good grip, as it was always the fullest being in the middle of the bar. "'You walked from Bell's Creek?' Tevens asked. "'That's a good twenty miles, ain't it?' "'Took me a good while,' Malcolm swigged the second shot of whiskey, smacked his lips. "'Sounds like a load of old bullshit to me,' Branlin said. Malcolm slowly rolled the shot glass back and forth between thumb and forefinger." watching the tiny bit of liquid left there is to slide around the inside. I think, he said, pausing to tip his head way back and throw that last drop down his throat, we've gotten off on the wrong foot here, fellas. He gently set the glass on the bar, his eyes locked on Branlin's single peeper, then casually slid it towards him, nodding for a refill. Oral tensed, fearing trouble, the cranky bartender was not one to be trifled with something he'd learned a long time ago. Mr. Tevens gestured to Branlin to fill the glass. I think what my bartender is getting at, Mr. Malcolm, is how you come to be lost in the desert for what must have been a long, hot stretch, and first thing you ask for is whiskey, not water. You got a rule or something? Thirsty man must drink water? Malcolm twisted, looking around the room. Because I don't see a sign. Just odds all. Teven said. Malcolm turned back to the bar and picked up the refilled shot glass. With an eye on Teven's, he knocked it back and set the glass down again. Hits the spot just fine. Oral could see the desire to give Malcolm George Malcolm the bum's rush burning in Mr. Teven's eyes. First thing he'd have to do once this all settled out was apologize for bringing the stranger into the saloon. Meanwhile, he still had three spittoons needed emptying, but he wasn't sure he should leave just in case there was some kind of fight and Mr. Tevens and Branlin needed him. This situation was his fault, after all. "'You staying long, Mr. Malcolm?' Tevens asked. Off Malcolm's expression, he added, "'In town, I mean.' "'Haven't made up my mind yet,' Malcolm said. "'Don't exactly seem like the most hospitable place,' he gestured to Branlin to pour another shot. "'Have to see how I feel after my business is concluded.' "'And what business might that be?' Maybe I can aid you in your endeavors, Teven said. As you might imagine, a man in my line of work is fairly well connected. Anything to hasten me on my journey, I suppose, Malcolm said. He lifted the shot glass, this time sipping the whiskey. Showing Tevens he wasn't in a hurry, Oral thought. Branlin used the tone of voice he fell into when it was near time to eject a troublemaker. Spoke up again. Sip away, friend. Bar's closing and that's your last drink. Malcolm eyed the bartender for a moment, then gently set the glass down. My business, Malcolm said, is sales. He tucked a hand inside his vest, freezing when Branlin reached beneath the bar, coming up with the Colt Banker's special. The barrel leveled at Malcolm's chest. Malcolm's gaze flicked from the Colt to Branlin's single eye. Did I mention the word inhospitable recently? He kept his hand inside his vest, unmoving. Oral took a cautious step away from the bar, positioning himself out of the line of fire. Or so he hoped, if things went further south. Let's not get carried away here, boys, Mr. Teven said. His hand had instinctively moved for his own gun, only to find it gone. Upstairs on his desk, still in the holster. Why don't you finish that drink, Mr. Malcolm, and then be on your way so we can close up for the night? Malcolm kept his eyes on Branlin's. I believe that sounds acceptable. 
If it's all right with everyone, I'd like to slowly extract my hand. There will be something in it, but I assure you now, it's not a gun or knife. You just be damn sure it happens slow, Branlin said. Malcolm took his time pulling his hand from his vest. There was indeed something held in it. You were curious about my business, Malcolm said, smiling. He opened his hand. In the palm lay a short, cylindrical object, hollow, about four inches long and an inch in diameter, blotchy yellowish-white in color, with dark streaks running along its length. One end was notched around the circumference, creating a ring of sharpened teeth. Oral, Tevens, and Branlin all took a hesitant step or two closer to get a better look. What is it? Oral asked on tiptoe now, leaning forward, not wanting to get too close to the stranger, but curious as hell about the object he held. Tool of my trade, Malcolm said. Some kind of carved bone or something? Tevens asked. Branlin, his gun still pointed at Malcolm but nearly forgotten, squinted his single eye and peered at the object. I got no idea what that is. You sell these ding whoppers? No, Malcolm said. I sell what comes out of it. Malcolm sprang up like some kind of monster insect, boots slamming onto the bar and grabbing a handful of Brainland's hair as the bartender's gun went off. Oral saw a spurt of gore as the bullet punched through Malcolm's back and continued up into the ceiling. Someone on the second floor screamed. Unfazed by the gunshot wound, Malcolm grinned down at Branlin from his perch on the bar and viciously jammed the mysterious object into Branlin's throat. The bartender gurgled, staggering back, and Malcolm casually plucked the gun from his hand. Son of a bitch! Tevens rushed at Malcolm. Hey now, Malcolm said, not looking at Tevens but swinging the pistol around to stop him in his tracks. Let's see what happens. What do you say? Choking, Branlin clutched at the object protruding from his throat. A small amount of blood trickled through the opening, but surprisingly little, considering the wound. Oral heard doors opening upstairs, shuffling footsteps as people reacted to the gunshot and the yelling. A couple of the braver whores appeared at the top of the stairs, along with one of the tricks. None of them seemed inclined to intervene. Here we go, Malcolm said. He spun atop the bar and plopped down on his ass, facing Oral and Tevens. Keeping the gun on them, he used his other hand to deftly unbutton his shirt about halfway down, revealing a circular black disc about three inches across embedded in the center of his chest. The flesh puckered around it. At the edge of the disc was a tiny knob like the winding stem of a pocket watch. Malcolm delicately twisted the knob in the center of the disc, irised open. Oral thought he could hear anguished whispers from within Malcolm's chest. Branlin let out a soft moan as he toppled forward, catching himself on the bar. He looked to Mr. Tevens, desperate, as a pale bluish mist began to seep from the end of the tube jammed into his neck. The mist swirled up and around Malcolm, then snaked its way into the hole in Malcolm's chest. Mmm, that's the stuff, Malcolm muttered, as the cloud of mist continued to pour from Branlin's body and wind its way into Malcolm's. Branlin's face grew ashen and withered, the skin sinking in to cling to his skull. His good eye bulged from the socket, pushing past the shriveled eyelids. Oral and Teven stared on in horror, accompanied by a slightly comical sputtering. The last of the mist dribbled from the tube in Branlin's neck and whirled around Malcolm to disappear within him. Branlin's body collapsed to the floor with a sound like a sack of dry leaves. There was silence for a moment. Then Malcolm hopped down from the bar. Ain't that about the craziest thing you ever did see? What in God's name did you do to him? Tevens hollered. What was that? That smoke, what came out of him? That, my friend, Malcolm said, giving another of his little theatrical flourishes, was your bartender's tainted soul. Teven sucked in a deep breath, the air whistling through his clenched teeth. Then you some kind of devil, then. No, sir, not at all. I'm as human as either of you standing here. Malcolm sat down on a bar stool again. What I am is more of a broker. Tevens nodded towards the bloody bullet wound in Malcolm's chest. That gunshot didn't even phase you. What kind of human is that? Funny, ain't it? Malcolm glanced at the bullet hole. Second time I've been shot with no real ill effect. 
stings a little, I must admit, but hell, gunshot like that, I ought to be laying here toes up. Seems to be something about having souls stored up in me. I got a couple others in there before I sucked up your buddy. Couple of folks I run into on my way here from Bell's Creek. Malcolm snatched up the bottle of whiskey from the bar. I can tell you, though, I've been shot when it wasn't so pleasant. He took a swig, put the bottle down, and wiped his mouth on the back of his hand. No, sir, I ain't no devil, but I've seen plenty of them out there. You sell them the souls you take, Oral said. Malcolm smiled at him. I must say, the simpleton keeps surprising me. Oral scowled, wanting to say something, but nervous about the gun in Malcolm's hand. How'd you come to be in this particular line of work? Tevens asked. Well, now that's a tale, Malcolm said, but I'll see if I can give you the short version. Towards the end of the war, I run into this old darky, a voodoo woman, she called herself. I didn't believe her at first, but I done a little something pissed her off, and next thing I know I'm stumbling around like a drunkard, only I ain't imbibed none. I passed out, and when I come around, I got this thing in my chest. Little old darky woman tells me she put a curse on me for what I done. She was the first one down my new soul gullet. Weren't long I start running into those devils I spoke of. Turns out most of them are in the market for an easy soul or two. Was the war brought them, you know. Oral didn't like the idea of devils wandering around freely. And more than that, he didn't like the idea of Malcolm going any damn place with Branlin's soul inside of him. He looked at Mr. Tevens. I'm sorry I brung this fella in, sir. It's all right, Oral, Mr. Tevens said. Hell yeah, it is, Malcolm said. You was just being a good Christian soul, he grinned again. And speaking of which, I expect the soul of a man owns a whorehouse that's probably a dime a dozen, not to mention his whores. Oral shivered as Malcolm turned his gaze upon him, looking him up and down. But a fella like thisn? Well, he might fetch a decent price. The moans from within the hole in Malcolm's chest rose in pitch, as if the souls locked away in there were excited about having the company. Mr. Teven sneered at Malcolm. There's any kind of human left in you, you'd let him go. He's just a kid. Malcolm slowly shook his head. I'm afraid I can't do that. I've got a business to run, after all. Oral struggled to keep the fear from showing on his face. I've seen crazier, he said. What now? The thing you did, taking Randlin's soul like that? You asked us if it was the craziest thing we ever seen. I'm telling you, I seen crazier. Malcolm looked at Mr. Tevens, amused. He gestured towards Oral with the gun. This and I tell you, to Oral, he said, All right, son, what in this great big world of ours could you possibly have seen that's crazier than what you witnessed moments ago? Oral gripped the edge of the spittoon, felt the thick, foul-smelling liquid inside the slop against his fingertips. Seen a flying monkey once? Malcolm stared at him for a long moment. His mouth opened slightly. Out back here, Oral said, where me and you met. A flying monkey, Malcolm said. Not flying like a bird, floating kind of like a leaf on a breeze and glowing. Oral shot a nervous glance at Mr. Tevens, worried that the older man would think he was out of his full mind. It was a little maybe half my size, didn't have no hair like a usual monkey, just kind of pinkish skin all over, came floating up out of the desert, looking at me and kind of smiling like it wanted to be friendly. Oral's eyes narrowed. Not a phony, mean smile like you've got. Malcolm's amused expression faded. So you and this floating and glowing monkey became the best of pals, I take it. And where's your pink little buddy now? Maybe upstairs with one of the whores? Oral hadn't felt this way since before his daddy run off. He didn't care for it, not one bit. He floated away after a few minutes. I ain't seen him since. Now what kind of a friend is that? Malcolm slid off his bar stool and walked over to Oral. Sounds like you might have got into the liquor that night, boy. Or maybe you just dreamed the whole damn thing. No, sir, Oral said. This was a couple months back. I ain't told no one. I was out late. Had to take Johnson out. That's my dog, Johnson. He's a basket hound. He's real old and don't get around so well. A basket hound? Malcolm shouted. God damn, you are a simpleton, son. Basket hound. He shook his head laughing. It's Bassett. Oral swung the spittoon as hard as he could into the side of Malcolm's head. 
Stunned, Malcolm dropped the pistol and stumbled back, tripping over his own feet. He fell, the back of his head thudding on the wooden floor. Oral's foot came down on his throat, grinding down into his windpipe. Malcolm let out a strangled gasp. Oral leaned over the man and started pouring the muck from the spittoon into the opening in his chest. Even with a foot on his throat, Malcolm managed to shriek in pain as the viscous crud slopped into him. He tried to get his hand up, turn the knob to shut the opening, but Oral knocked it away. Twisting in agony, Malcolm's gaze fell upon a skinny, ancient dog laying in a basket under the stairs, head lifted, watching Malcolm, incuriously. Oral lifted his foot from Malcolm's throat. Wheezing, Malcolm tried to wriggle away as Tevens loomed over him. A large knife... Or maybe it was a short sword, hard to tell, his vision blurred the way it was, in his hand. Teven swung the blade. It took two tries to separate Malcolm's head from his body. It rolled to one side, Malcolm's dying eyes falling once again on the dog beneath the stairs. Johnson lowered his head to the edge of the basket, still watching, disinterested, as Malcolm's eyes fluttered, then closed. Oral poured the rest of the slop into Malcolm's chest until the opening overflowed, then stepped away from the lifeless body, breathing hard, not taking his eyes off the corpse. I have a job, and I do okay for myself, Oral said. Just Just a a Dream dream by by Joe Joe Salmo David sat up in the cold darkness of his room, unable to breathe. His Superman underoos were soaked with a cold sweat. He listened in the darkness, wide-eyed, but heard nothing. He tried to scream, but nothing came out. It must have only been a dream, he thought, as rational thought returned to his eight-year-old mind. He laid back down on the bottom bunk, finally able to breathe. His brother William started to snore above him. At least his sleep was undisturbed. This was the fourth night this week that David woke in this manner. He looked down on the floor over the edge of his bed adorned in Thundercat's bedsheets. On the floor he saw his stuffed owl named Woodsy. Woodsy had a small radio embedded inside its stomach, and when he got scared in the darkness, he could turn the radio on low and hear another human voice. It helped, sometimes. The radio kept him company until light started to shine through the window. He was already awake when William's alarm went off. It was summertime, but William took a summer job working with the neighbor, helping on his farm. David watched as his brother climbed down the wooden ladder built into the front of their beds. William? he asked. What are you doing up? It's 5 a.m., William said, running his hand through his hair. Bad dream again? Yeah, this time it was worse. They made it inside, David said. Don't worry. Even if they get inside, they can't hurt you. I won't let them. William said, smiling at his younger brother. Your snoring sounded like Kit from Knight Rider, David said in response. And I'm sure that would scare them off. See? No problem, William joked and headed for the small bathroom attached to their room to get ready for work on the farm. So reassuring, David said, pulling his blanket off the bed and walking out to the living room. He climbed onto the couch and closed his eyes. Tonight maybe I'll sleep out here. Maybe the dreams can't find me, David thought, as sleep overtook him. When David's eyes opened, the first thing he noticed was how bright it was. The TV was on, and the god-awful show Guiding Light was on. He could smell French toast being cooked in the kitchen, and knew his mom was making breakfast. He twisted his head around to look through the open arch into the kitchen. He heard clanking as he watched his mother set the table for breakfast, her eyes glued to their television. The cinnamon she added to the eggs made his mouth water, and David got up and headed to the kitchen. Good morning, honey, his mother said with a smile. Rough night? Yeah, I had a bad dream, David replied. Oh, I'm sorry, baby. Did coming out to the couch help? she asked. A little, yeah. Can I sleep there tonight? David asked. Not tonight. Your father is having some friends over, and they'll be watching the game, his mother said. It's okay, I can watch the game with them, David said, hopefully. Not tonight, I'm sorry. Did your brother get off to work this morning? She asked. Yeah, he said he would be home for lunch today, David said. He wants bologna. Did he really? His mother asked with a smile. Your brother asked for your favorite sandwich for lunch? 
I thought he hated baloney, his mother said. Well, he didn't come out and exactly say it. It was kind of implied, David said. Uh Uh-huh, his mother said, placing two pieces of French toast on his plate. Eat up. I've got to go to the store and you have to come with me, she said. Do I have to? David whined. Yes, you're too young to stay by yourself, she said. After dinner, David went to his room to play with his Castle Grayskull playset. His brother came in shortly after and turned on his radio that sat on a shelf opposite their beds. Soon, Pat Benatar's unique voice came from the speakers mounted on the wall. Do you have to listen to that so loud? David asked. Sure do. Sorry, William said, climbing up onto his bunk. David sighed. He put his action figures into his toy box and closed up the castle. Sometimes his brother could be a real jerk. He wished they didn't have to share rooms, but their house just wasn't big enough. He left their shared room to hang out in the living room. When he got there, it was full of people he'd never seen before, all of them smoking with drinks in their hands. The game was on the TV. What are you doing out here? His father asked, smiling. William is listening to music so loud I can't hear my action figures talk to each other, David said with a pout. Well, I'll have a talk with him. You shouldn't be out here with all of us adults, his father said, putting out his non-filtered Lucky Strike cigarette. David let his father lead him back to his room. He knew he would get it from his brother once his father left. William, turn that shit down, David's father yelled. Come on, it's not even that loud, William retorted. You have to share your room with your brother. Try to find a happy medium, will ya? I got guests over and it's a cloud of smoke. No place for a kid, their father said. All right, fine. Can I go over to Brian's? William asked. He asked me to spend the night. No, David said. Yeah, it's fine with me. Just check with your mother. Why do you care, Davy? Their father asked. I would be all alone tonight, he said. He didn't want to show his dad he was afraid of the dark. Exactly. You can play as late as you want. I promise, his father said and winked, like he was doing David a favor. Cool, let me call Brian, William said and left the room. David watched his brother leave the room, carrying his chances of a good night's sleep. His father left to return to his friends, and suddenly, the shadows in the corners of the room seemed more sinister. Three hours later, David sat in his bed with a flashlight and a Spider-Man comic. His mom had tucked him in, but he got back up. She had noticed the light spilling under the door into the hall, so he had to pilfer the flashlight from under the bathroom sink. He secretly wished Spider-Man was real, and could save him from the bad dreams. He yawned as he turned the pages. It didn't take long for his week of little sleep to catch up to him, and less than 20 minutes later, he was asleep. David's eyes suddenly flipped open. The room was completely dark. He turned his head and looked at the clock on the radio across the room. 2.15. Oh no, he thought. It was the same time every night. He listened and heard the sound of the tires on the gravel driveway. He jumped up and ran to the window. He saw the black car with no headlights coming up the driveway. The car looked like an old hearse with black tinted windows. There wasn't a single color on the car besides black. The bumper, lights, hubcaps, everything covered in black. The car stopped about 20 feet from the house. He watched as the doors opened and four beings stepped out. They were tall and skinny, wearing what looked like tuxedos, but without a shirt underneath. Their pale skin almost shone in the moonlight. He couldn't make out their faces. It wasn't that they didn't have one, it's just... It was fuzzy, like when the reception goes out on their TV and his father swears and has to adjust the rabbit ears. Fuzzy except for their mouths. They didn't have lips. The mouths were almost completely circle, lined with sharp, glistening teeth, rows of them like a shark's mouth, only round. 
They didn't make a sound as they lined up next to each other in the driveway. They more glided when they walked towards the house, in complete unison. Swirls of fog flickered with red, yellow, and orange lights, parted for them as they closed the gap between the car and the house. He watched as they came straight towards his room, not the front door. He ducked under the covers. David started to shake. It had to be a dream. It's only a dream, he thought. Wake up, he yelled inside his head. There was no sound from outside the blankets. He wanted to peek so badly, but couldn't muster up the courage to do so. A minute passed, then two. Still no sound from outside the blankets. He looked at the Thundercats on his sheets and wished he had their courage. He tried to calm his breathing, fearing that the blankets moving up and down would alert them to his hiding place. He imagined them in his room looking in the toy box for him and checking the small bathroom. He moved his arms slowly, as slowly as he could, hoping they wouldn't notice the movement if it was slow enough. He held his breath for a second. Still no sounds came from the room. Was it possible they couldn't get inside his room? The dream never went that far. They would peer into his windows like he was on display for them. Like some kind of zoo. Suddenly the blankets were yanked off of him. He looked up at the top of the bunk bed, no longer against the wall. Mist filled his room, flickering red, orange, and yellow light reflecting on the white wisps. On each side were two of the beings. People, aliens, demons, whatever. They bent their pale heads under the top bunk. David was paralyzed with fear. He couldn't move. He felt his pajama top rise up and tuck itself under his chin. His eyes opened as wide as they could as the one closest to him on the right side reached into a pocket on the black suit it wore. David's imagination ran wild with what it had in there. Some torture device? He followed the movement of the thing's pale hand, the only muscle he could move, as it pulled something out of the pocket. He saw a flash of yellow before the creature hit it behind its pale palm. What the hell was that? David thought. It looked like... It it couldn't be, could it? David's look grew confused as the creature put the item in its right hand. It was! It was the yellow screwdriver from his Fisher-Price tool set. His dad bought him when he tried to help his father fix the furnace one year. The creature brought the plastic screwdriver out and over his stomach. All four of the creatures tilted their heads to the side at the same time, making a shiver run down David's spine. The creature with the screwdriver drove it down into his flesh and pulled it down, essentially making an autopsy incision in his own chest. He watched in horror as a creature on each side peeled back his skin. Another creature from the right side pulled a Fisher-Price hammer from his pocket, its oversized red plastic head on the end of the dowel looking maroon in the darkness. It swung the hammer down into David's chest cavity. He felt the impact on his bone. He heard a crack on the second swing. He tried to call out for his parents, but only the sound of air escaping his mouth came out. A tear formed on his left eye. He watched as the other two began to poke and prod inside his chest cavity. He felt them tug on things inside. He tried to struggle but was either paralyzed with fear or some other means. He couldn't do anything but watch. The creatures never spoke or communicated with each other in any way. They just worked on him, like they had done a million times. A moment later, David heard another sound. The sound of a car on the gravel outside. The creatures heard it too. They all looked up at each other in unison and dissipated into a white mist. Suddenly David could move. He sat up straight in bed and screamed, a real, honest-to-goodness, blood-curdling scream. Within seconds, his mother was in the room flipping on the light. "'What's wrong, honey?' she said with concern in her voice. David sat there, panting, covered in sweat. "'Honey?' she asked. She ran to his side and put her hand on his head. Are you okay? David came out of it a minute later and felt his chest. There was nothing there. He was normal. He heard a knock at the front door and turned toward his mother. 
What's going on? he asked. I don't know. Stay here. I'll find out, she said and started to leave. No, don't leave me, he said. His mom's face showed the struggle between concern for David and curiosity at the door. They both heard David's father grumbling as he headed to the door after the second knock. David left the bed and headed for the window on the driveway side. There was a police car there. He thought about telling the police about the creatures, but then felt silly. It had to have been a dream. His chest was fine. He snuck out of his room and hid behind an end table to listen to the conversation the police was having with his father. Come on, Dad. I'm sure you did the same thing when you were a kid. He heard William's voice, but it sounded weird, like in slow motion. You're 16 years old, and you lied to us. You told us you were staying at Brian's, his father said angrily. He thanked the officer and heard the door slam. David fell back to the doorway, just in case they came his way. His brother looked dizzy as he made his way towards the bathroom, David's father leading him. His mother came over to the doorway, making his position. Honey, come on back to bed. William will be joining you soon. Your brother will keep the bad dreams away, she said. It was so real this time. They got inside, David said, but she wasn't listening. She led him back to his room. Joan, William is going to sleep on the couch tonight. I don't want him falling out of bed drunk, David heard his father say. He reluctantly climbed into his sheets, and his mom ducked down next to the bed and began to tuck him in. Don't worry, honey. It was only a dream, she said. I know, Mom, David said to appease her. He felt something under him on the bed. He reached under as his mom shut out the light and began to close the door. He looked at what was in his hand, expecting the flashlight. It was the yellow screwdriver. A graven cold settled into David's bones. A bead of sweat broke on his brow and he tried to pull the blankets over his head. But he couldn't move. His room began to fill with white mist. The Devil Reaps the Harvest by John Oak Dalton The laboratory at the end of the Dead End Road had been closed for so long now that people had forgotten all about it. Or tried to forget about it. And now everybody said it was an abandoned factory. It was there that Peter O'Day was supposed to meet a guy who had a couple of kidneys and a beer cooler. So Peter parked in a weed-choked employee lot and walked about a quarter of a mile into the woods, where the old laboratory sat. There, he was meeting Octavius. Octavius sounded like a mad scientist's name, and as it happened, Octavius kind of was a mad scientist. He had worked at the lab long ago, doing things that are frowned upon in the mainstream medical world, but... That gig dried up. He ended up harvesting organs, which wasn't much of a step down. He still liked meeting people there for the handoff, because his greatest triumphs had been at that lab. Also his greatest failures, but those were buried here, and there, around the property. Peter had a bag of money, and Octavius had a cooler with organs in it and a New England Patriots sticker on it, so that went down about like you'd expect. Peter was a dot-com guy the bubble never burst on, so he had plenty of money and could jump the transplant list and buy a new kidney for their little girl, Alondra. People with money can pretty much do what they want. Just look at celebrities. They do drugs and get married eight or ten times, but can adopt all the kids they want and go on TV talking about various causes. If they did all the same things but lived in that trailer park on the other edge of town the one called Morningside, but everybody actually called it Homicide, nobody would give them kids or want them on TV talking about their causes. When Peter took the Patriots cooler from Octavius that had a kidney and a spare for Alondra, his hands were shaking pretty badly, and some of the blood sloshed out from under the lid and onto his shoes and into the dirt, and it wasn't until that very moment that Peter sort of realized what the hell he was doing. Octavius stepped back easily and missed the sloshing, but he was used to blood spraying out all over the place. Peter nodded and walked away, 
but Octavius stayed where he was, to his misfortune. He had parked behind the old lab on an access road everybody had forgotten about, too, because he did not want Peter or anybody else to see the car he drove. Peter was hardly out of sight when something just under Octavius' feet, where the blood was soaking in, sniffed and swallowed and opened its eyes. If this lab had been that good at black science, they'd still be in business, but they weren't, so they made the mistake of burying their problems instead of burning them in a big bonfire so that there would be no trace. Or, in this case, so something could not bite and claw its way with long fingernails and sharp teeth out of the dirt and grab Octavius by the ankles, then pull him to the ground and bite him right on his face. But his face was kind of bony, so it started working on some of the soft parts. Peter had stopped not far away to call his wife, but never heard a damn thing. It was ironic because as soon as that creature's hand popped out of the dirt, Octavius's heart popped like a balloon. All those times Octavius had arranged for guys to meet Russian women off the internet for a night of passion, only for those guys to wake up in the hotel tub packed in ice or dumped in a landfill and never waking up at all. All those times Octavius never knew he needed an organ himself. He ignored the shortness of breath and the tingling in his fingers and all the rest. Like I said, if they were better at science, they would still have been in business. And if they weren't all so lazy, they would have buried these things deeper. Peter's wife was named Stacy and was waiting in a big McMansion out in the suburbs for news of Alondra's kidney. Do I even need to say that this was his second wife? And very young? We're halfway there, Peter told her. It's not like a pig kidney or anything, she asked. How would I know? I don't know, she fretted. Look, this guy came highly recommended, and when it comes to Alondra, we don't have another choice. I know, said Stacy, and there was a lot in those words. And those two words were all the feelings Stacy had growing for little Alondra, and all the feelings Peter lacked. But Peter did what he had to do. What Peter had to do next was walk out of the edge of the overgrown parking lot and wait for a guy from the transplant organization he'd paid off. Actually, this guy, whose name was Rollo, knew Octavius quite well, but neither man wanted anyone to know they were connected. Rollo had worked in that lab, too, back in the day. Not so much in the sciences as in the more nebulous parts of the organization. Octavius could have just given the organ to Rollo, but Octavius and Rollo always wanted a middleman. It wasn't foolproof, but it was better than nothing. Look, just go to the hospital and wait. Peter said. The guy is on his way here, and then he is going to be bringing the kidneys within the hour. Okay, said Stacy, but there was so much she could not face. She knew she was staying right where she was. Okay, and Peter hung up. Peter had only taken a few steps before he saw something moving in the trees, just out of the corner of his eye. Of course, Peter was thinking it was a cop, or the FBI, or maybe an investigative reporter trying to entrap him and put him on TV with all the pedophiles. So Peter stepped off the road and hid behind a tree, which was stupid because unlike cops and FBI agents and reporters, what was shambling towards him could smell the blood on his shoes. Peter peeked around the tree and realized he was wrong about the cops and the reporters because how this person was dressed, how this shape was dressed, was in things goodwill would not take. They looked like clothes somebody took out of a compost pile. Peter started moving quickly through the trees, trying not to slosh the beer cooler too much and cut cross-country towards the parking lot. All the bones and muscles and ligaments in the thing sniffing along behind Peter, which seemed barely connected to each other, still let the thing move faster than you would think. But it would not have mattered if Peter had watched where he was going, which he did not. So he overshot the parking lot and thrashed deeper into the woods. And the thing that could smell his bloody footprints, who saw the shoe prints glowing like fire, kept on coming. 
Peter saw the bland gray concrete block of the lab building looming in front of him, and he realized he'd been a dumbass and circled back on himself. He was ultimately a tech guy. He'd never been much out in nature and did not really know how to navigate even a small forest of trees, much less tell one from another. And he'd never seen a dead body. But he recognized that Octavius was dead when he saw what was left of him in the small clearing where they had met up minutes ago. The chewed parts and the parts that should have been tucked inside but were glistening in the sun. The thing behind Peter was getting closer. So close now, Peter could hear a slurping noise. And Peter turned and looked. And what he saw sent his heart plummeting and his balls scurrying up inside himself to meet it. And his butthole slammed shut with the finality of a coffin lid. Peter dropped the beer cooler, and this time a lot more blood sloshed out than was good. And the thing moved faster somehow. Peter grabbed the cooler back up and started running. Peter was running, and the only place he knew he was running was away, wherever that was. And he was bouncing off of trunks and getting whipped in the face by branches and all that because, instead of joining Boy Scouts, he had taught himself computer programming. He was richer, but very close to being dead. So, some of his life choices seemed poorer today. He kept splashing blood out of that cooler, and that wasn't great for Alondra, but... More importantly for Peter, it wasn't great for him at all. So Peter stopped and opened the cooler. He plunged his hand in and grabbed out a kidney that was in a leaky sandwich bag, and he flung that kidney in a long red arc that hit the thing's chest with a wet sound and plopped into the grass. And the creature looked down at it with yellow eyes, and it gave Peter a chance to catch his breath. Then the creature showed broken teeth and reached down with those long nails and grabbed the kidney up. And it went down in one gulp, and Peter threw up in his mouth a little. When Peter ran this time, he didn't even pick up the cooler. The thing tipped the cooler back and gulped the other kidney down, and that bought Peter a little more time. Peter ran and looked back, ran and looked back, and sure enough, in a minute or two he saw that raggedy shape moving between the trees again. Peter was looking back when his foot touched asphalt, and he was out on a country road. The woman driving the minivan was leaning over pushing the Hocus Pocus DVD into the dashboard for her kids in the back seat to watch for the millionth time, so she didn't even tap the brake before she hit Peter head on. Rather than explain what that looked like, it's simpler to say the kids never ask to watch Hocus Pocus ever again. As it happens, Rolla was not too far behind the woman in a truck that looked like a medical vehicle, but really wasn't. Rolla was very quick on his feet and looked like he had a lot of authority. He bet on ponies with the same authority, but no common sense, which is what got him into this bad situation to begin with. It didn't take much for Rolo to convince the stunned woman that he was going to take care of everything, and she was free to go. He would even contact her insurance company for her. She wrote everything down on a piece of paper with tears in her eyes. Of course, as soon as she drove away, he chucked that paper in a cup of cold coffee he'd left on the dash. Rolo set to looking around for that cooler and started back into the tree line. He didn't find it, but he found a shambling, shuffling creature with blood dripping off of a lipless, leering mouth and grasping, clawed hands stained with blood. Rolo was a bad gambler, but he'd been a good crooked cop and a decent EMT who stole drugs, so he took a snub-nosed 32 he kept under his shirt tail in the back and shot that thing in both its yellow eyes. It fell down, as you might suspect, and did not get back up. Then Rolo found the empty, bloody cooler with the Patriot sticker on it. His mind remained remarkably clear, and he knew what he had to do. Rolo did a very good job at the transplant center, which was his real job now, but he paid special attention when he was getting a fat envelope on the side. Rolo pulled Peter's body up into the back of the white truck, that if you squinted your eyes at it, might be a medical vehicle. He had some tools back there that could have medical uses. The back of his truck was not as clean as some places, but it was not as dirty as the back room of that massage parlor where Rolo knew Octavius had done a little surgery. If he hadn't already been a decent EMT, he could have used YouTube. 
Stacy had been sitting very still in her spacious living room when the doorbell rang. She answered it, her hands trembling. Two stone-faced men in dark suits stared at her. Stacy O'Day? One asked. It was more of a statement than a question. Yes, is this about Alondra? She asked. In a manner of speaking, the man showed her a piece of official-looking paper. This is a warrant to search your house. Stacy took a step back. But Alondra's in the hospital. She needs a transplant. It, it's on its way. Why is this happening right now? The man looked at her. That's just it. The hospital checked. There's no record that Alondra was officially adopted from anywhere. Stacy swallowed hard. There's no record she was ever enrolled in school. Stacy got her feet under her. She's, she's homeschooled. Your neighbors have a lot to say. One of them says they saw a mattress on the floor in the basement next to an ironing board and a stack of laundry. Stacy shook her head. We're painting her room. So can you show me that room? He asked. Like I said, it's, it's being painted. The cop gave her a thousand yard stare. You're not the first housewife that needed a little help around the place. Tears showed in Stacy's eyes. She's living better than she was in that hellhole orphanage. She will be. She's in surgery, and the kidney looks like it's going to take. Stacy leaned against the wall with relief, which surprised the two cops. But she's not coming back here, the cop added. Stacy stood up straight. If I didn't care, I wouldn't have pushed to get her that kidney when she got sick. The cop had cold eyes. What else could you do? I reckon you didn't keep the receipt. Stacy processed this. She looked the cop full in the face. This whole thing, it started out differently than it ended. With Alondra. At least for me. Stacy making that statement was the only thing that kept the cops from cuffing her and banging her head on the door when they lowered her into the back seat. They let her walk out on her own free will, but she did not see that McMansion again for a long time. The cops assumed Peter had run out on Stacy and all of their problems. Nobody ever found a trace of him. They were soon distracted by a very large fire at an old factory in the woods outside of town, which burned a big tract of land. Rolo had a steady hand and a clear head, and got a bonus for all his quick thinking. Didn't change his luck at the track, but you can't have it all. The Rest Area by Rob Fields Brad and Robbie were traveling along U.S. Route 23 while coming back from the Ohio State Fair one Saturday evening late in the summer. The two friends were talking about all the fun they had while at the fair, when eventually they came to a very dark part of the freeway nearly devoid of traffic. As Robbie was driving, Brad came up with a mischievous idea. He grinned slightly and turned to face Robbie. Hey Robbie, have you heard the stories about Aaron Rudder? He's supposed to be an axe murderer who just escaped from the state mental hospital, you know? Robbie sighed, but kept his eyes on the road. It's been said that he's hacked up about ten people around this area in the last two days, Brad continued, talking in a more quiet, eerie voice. Robbie muttered a sigh. You are so weird, man, Brad continued. Rumor also has it that he eats his victims, too. Robbie tried to ignore him, but Brad kept on going. Sometimes he even fillets them. Robbie groaned, Would you please shut up? Brad just laughed. Oh, Robbie, you scare way too easy. Robbie didn't pay any attention. They continued on down the freeway. Eventually, they passed a sign that said that a rest area was about one mile ahead. Hey, Robbie, could you pull off at the rest area when we get to it? Brad asked. I need to use the bathroom. Robbie sighed. I guess. When they got to the rest area's off-ramp, Robbie pulled off the freeway and parked the car. They both got out. I'll just be a few minutes, Brad said. Take your time, Robbie replied. Brad walked to the men's restroom and went in. After taking a piss, he washed his hands and came back outside. He looked to the car to see Robbie wasn't in it. Suddenly, he heard something snap not too far off in the distance. He waited there for a moment. When he didn't hear anything, he started walking back toward the car. Suddenly, he heard another snap. Only, it was closer this time. 
Robbie? Brad uttered. Is that you? There was no answer. Robbie? Brad repeated, now sounding tense. There was still no answer. He heard another snap. As before, it was closer. Brad was feeling really uneasy. Then, as if on impulse, he turned and headed toward the area where the vending machines were. As he was about to open the door and head in, he heard yet another snap, and again, it was closer. He turned around to look behind him. Suddenly, a figure leapt out from nearby. Brad felt a straight edge strike him at the back of his right shoulder blade. He was struck again almost immediately. Brad screamed with each chop. And again. And again. And again. Chop, 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 the axe murderer shouted with glee. Brad then realized something wasn't right. For one thing, he didn't feel anything actually cutting into his skin. Second, he recognized who it was that was attacking him. Brad quickly turned around to see him. Robbie, Brad shouted. It was you? Robbie burst out into wild laughter. It was you all the time? Brad cried. Robbie managed to collect himself. He pointed to Brad. You should have seen your face. Brad's face twisted in anger. I could just kill you. Robbie stopped laughing and became serious. Oh, but it was okay for you to keep carrying on about Aaron Rudder in the car, huh? When Brad heard this, he calmed down knowing Robbie was right. He sighed. All right, we're even. All right, Robbie agreed. Let's get out of here and get home. Sure. As they were walking back to the car, Brad said, You know, that was clever how you broke those sticks on the way to the vending machines. Robbie looked at Brad oddly. I didn't break any sticks, man. Brad looked at him in surprise. You didn't? No, Robbie answered. I was hiding behind the car. When I saw you going to the vending area, I came out from behind the car and got you. I know I didn't break any sticks. Now Brad was really confused. Then if it wasn't you... I did. A deep, rumbling voice not belonging to either of them answered from behind them. They quickly turned around to see a big man with an axe in his hands, and he was smiling at them in a very demented way. So nice of you guys to show up for a late night dinner, the man said to them in a crazed tone. Robbie and Brad knew at once who this man was, and they screamed in terror. They quickly turned and ran for their car. Aaron Rudder was right behind them. As Robbie tried to get into the car, he heard the slam and immediately saw the axe blade embedded in the roof of the car. Brad was already a long way away from the car. Robbie lashed out and kicked Rudder in the stomach to stun him. Then he turned away from the car and ran himself. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! Robbie gasped as he ran for all he was worth, so much so that he was feeling his own heart pounding. Robbie and Brad were both running into the woods behind the rest area in separate directions. They both knew Rudder would likely catch up to them. Robbie pressed himself up against a tree to try and catch his breath. I've got to find Brad, he thought as he continued to catch his breath, trying to make as little noise as possible as he quickly tried to process the hell he currently found himself in. Suddenly, Robbie screeched as he just barely avoided the axe blade that damn near embedded itself into his throat. He pushed himself away from the tree and resumed running. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Aaron Rudder trying to pull the axe out of the tree. Robbie knew he didn't have much time before this insane psycho would be after him again, and he still had to find Brad. Robbie bolted into the darkness, barely avoiding oncoming trees. He knew he had to try to get back to the car, somehow. He needed to get to his cell phone, which he remembered leaving in one of the cup holders. Or better yet, maybe he could get the hell out of the place. Rationality set in quickly, and he knew he couldn't just leave Brad behind. What the fuck am I going to do? He demanded of himself. Robbie backed himself up against another large tree. Again, he tried to take breaths without being too loud and alerting Rudder to his location. If he didn't know already. Okay, okay, you gotta, you gotta think straight now, he mouthed to himself. Okay, where are you? You gotta think straight now. Where is the car? Where is it? He took one more long, deep breath and decided to try to get back to the rest area and get to the car. Robbie looked both ways to make sure that Aaron Rudder wasn't ready to chop off his head again, and slowly pushed himself away from the tree and turned around. Cautiously, he started to make his way back to the car. After several careful steps, 
He muttered a curse as he heard the stick that broke under his foot. Fuck, he mouthed to himself. Shit. Robbie forced himself to keep moving, pissed at Brad for not shutting the fuck up about the insane psycho. And just why the batshit crazy fucking hell did Aaron Rudder really have to even be at that rest area? Robbie didn't used to believe in things like fate, but now he wasn't so sure. Maybe Brad is on his way back to the car, he mouthed to himself. Robbie moved from one tree to another, to another, cautiously, carefully, quietly. Snap! God damn it! Robbie whispered loudly when he felt another stick break under his shoe. Robbie forced himself to remain focused and saw the lights in the distance. This had to be the rest area. What else was lit up brightly at that part of outer Marion, Ohio at that hour of night? He kept looking left. Right, having eyes in the back of his head, face front, the lights were so close and so far away. Robbie also considered that Aaron Rudder might even be waiting at the car for either one of them. Okay, maybe Rudder wasn't hanging out at the car, but it was possible that he was keeping an eye on it. Okay, I just have to get to my cell phone, Robbie thought, or if Brad is there, we, we can get the hell out of here. Robbie felt in his pockets. He felt some relief in knowing that he still had the keys on him, but then he never just left his keys in the car, for any reason. He still had his wallet, not that he could buy Rudder off, right? But I just had to leave my fucking cell phone in my car, of all the fucking things I could leave in my car, I just had to leave my fucking cell phone, how fucking dumb can I get? Robbie decided there was no point in crying over spilled milk, he continued to creep further towards the rest area. He started to feel as if the rest area was moving further away from him. He shook his head quickly and kept moving. After agonizing minutes, Robbie had finally returned to the rest area. He moved to the back wall and made his way around to get back to the front. He was in such a big hurry to get to the main entrance that he didn't see the person had suddenly placed a hand on his shoulder. Robbie shrieked and started to run. Robbie! He quickly stopped when he saw it was Brad. The two of them both backed themselves up against the wall and looked each other over. Robbie looked at Brad as if saying, You're alive. Brad nodded in acknowledgement. They turned and started to creep along the wall until they were both looking out at the parking lot. A lone car suddenly sped by the rest area. Both of them looked around to see if Aaron Rudder was nearby. When they didn't see him, they cautiously moved out into the open and made their way towards the car. When they reached it, they quickly got into the car and pulled the doors shut. Robbie locked all the doors with a simple push of a switch on his inside door. He moved to start the car. No keys. Robbie remembered that he had them in his pocket. He quickly dug for them and pulled them out. As he slid the ignition key in, Brad screamed, and the driver's side window shattered. Glass exploded all over Robbie and Brad. Leaving so soon? Rudder grumbled. It's still dinner time. Robbie didn't even think about it. He quickly turned the ignition key and started the car. He quickly shifted into reverse and sped out of the parking lot. Rudder raised his axe and gave chase. Robbie put the car in drive and hit the gas. They'd only gone a little bit when they felt something hit the trunk. Brad turned around. He hit the trunk with that axe! Robbie hit the brakes. What the fuck are you doing? Brad yelled at Robbie. Hang on. Robbie pulled the car in reverse again and hit the gas. This time, both of them saw Rudder holding on to his axe handle as Robbie backed the car closer and closer until... Boom. Shit, Brad cried. Shit was right. Robbie managed to get Aaron Rudder off of the car, but at the cost of backing into a utility pole, which caused the trunk to come open. The axe came loose and landed near the back window. At that moment, another car pulled into the rest area. Brad quickly got out and frantically waved to the people in the other car. Get the hell out of here! Brad took a few steps and pushed the trunk lid shut. Surprisingly, it didn't come open again. He got back in the car. Go! Robbie shifted the gears and floored the accelerator. The tires squealed as the two of them pulled away from the rest area. Robbie had hit 100 miles per hour by the time he'd merged onto US Route 23 North. He didn't slow the car down again until he cleared the Marion Bypass and reached State Route 4. From there, they would turn towards Bucyrus and head for home. Later, after dropping Brad off, Robbie walked into his house. Robbie shrieked when he felt something leap out at him. Robbie realized where he was again, and whom he was holding. Oh, hey doggy, he said. You gotta stop coming at me like that, he sighed. Come on, let's go to bed. Whew, Robbie said to himself. 
Well, at least we left that crazy motherfucker back at that rest area. From there, Robbie went into his room and got ready for bed. When he got into bed, his dog still seemed restless, but still managed to get a few solid licks in. Come on, buddy, stop with the licking already and go to sleep. That was the last thing Robbie remembered before he was dead to the world. Licking is what woke Robbie up from a sound sleep. Robbie groaned as he felt the gentle licking on the side of his face. Then Robbie realized something was off when he smelled something weird as the dog kept licking. Barbecue sauce? Robbie tried to move, but he realized quickly that he couldn't. He quickly woke up fully and took in his surroundings. He saw that he was outside, in the backyard. He also realized he was getting hotter. That was when he felt his own flesh starting to burn. Robbie was tied and gagged on his own barbecue grill. Oh, hi. A horrible, familiar grumbling voice said in his ear. So glad you woke up. Dinner will be ready soon. Robbie looked up and saw Aaron Rudder wearing an apron and dipping the brush back into the barbecue sauce. You worked up quite an appetite in me, Rudder continued. Just a few more strokes, and all done. Robbie couldn't really think anymore as the flames started to lick and burn his flesh. Aaron Rudder would finally get his dinner. Echo by Shane, Shane Migliavaca. I first met him last week. Though I'd heard about the new guy in town before that, Castle, New York was the smallest of small towns. Word travels fast when somebody new moves to town. Travis looked like he stepped out of one of those 50s biker films, and last Thursday, when he walked into the diner I work at, I couldn't take my eyes off him, and he knew it. He caught me looking at him and smiled that sly smile of his. My eyes darted away, and I tried to make it look like I was working around the diner, but it was too late. He strode over to me. Hello there, he said. Hey, I tried to sound confident like I didn't give a fuck, but my voice cracked. He smiled at me. Can I get a chocolate milkshake to go? Sure. I heard they're like, wow, here. I started making the shake as he leaned on the counter. He looked at his reflection in the glass case of donuts, adjusting his perfect hair. Yeah, they're really good, I said, unsuccessfully thinking of something cool to say. Lived here all your life? he asked. Unfortunately. Ain't so bad. I've been to worse. I finished the shake and brought it over to him. He gave me a wink and took a sip. Before I could say anything, he slid a $10 bill across the counter. A large silver ring gleamed on his hand. He turned and started to leave. Let me get your change. The rest is for you, Dolly. I watched him go. Dolly? I felt a bit offended, but at the same time I was feeling something else. Love? Lust? Whatever it was, it made me somewhat forgiving of the Dolly remark. So that's the new guy. Not bad. I turned and it was my co-worker and friend, Bren. She adjusted her raven hair. What did he say to you, Ronnie? Nothing much, just wanted a milkshake. Yeah, yours. We both laughed. Bren has this obnoxious laugh that usually ends up making me laugh even harder. The next day, he didn't show up, but the day after that, he was there again. This time, wanting a milkshake and a burger. No matter who waited on him, he always ended up talking to me, usually asking me about some town idiosyncrasy or whatnot, always coming in at the same time, every other day. It continued like this for a month. We'd small talk a little, and then he'd leave. I never saw him outside of the diner. Then one day, he changed the routine. I got off work one sunny Monday afternoon, and Travis was waiting for me. He was leaning ever so slightly against the side of the diner. He smiled at me. Hey, I said. Hey, he answered. He flicked out a metal lighter and lit a slim cigarette. So what do you do for a kick around here? 
there's the movie theater or the bowling alley. No, no, you, he took a puff. Me? Uh, not much. Nah? Dang shame, pretty little girl like you. Um, thanks. The flattery made me blush. Was he hitting on me? I sucked at this kind of thing. I wasn't sure if he wanted me to say anything. I haven't found much in town to get excited about. Dullsville, really. He took a long drag on his cigarette. So I was wondering if, uh, you want to hang? I thought for a second. He's asking me out. I suck at dating. He's good looking and seems nice, but there's no way a date between us won't end in embarrassment for me. And perhaps him too. How can I talk him out of it? It's kind of been a rough day, you know? Mondays? I just want to go back home and chill. It don't have to be today. Oh, cool. So, want to see a flick? He said. Show the new guy the sights? Sure. Am I really going to do this? Yeah, I I guess I was. Why not? I deserve some fun, right? Right. You do. Bren was always trying to get me to go out. This would really shock her. Tomorrow night good? I thought about it. Did you know I didn't have to work the day after? Sure. Aces. It's a date then. I'll let you pick the flick. Cool? Yeah. He looked at me. You should always have your hair like that. I touched my hair. I forgot I tied it back at work. This was probably the first time he saw it loose. It's so beautiful and red, like a rose. Thanks. My face lit up as I blushed. Great. Gotta run, babe. Be seeing you. He did a little point at me and winked before leaving, the spurs on the back of his cowboy boots jangling as he went. What had I got myself into? Our first date went well, as did the next three. Before I realized it, we were a thing in town. I think Bren was jealous. For our fifth date, Travis wanted to take me on a picnic to Harmony Lake. It would be our first date in a less public space. I wasn't too worried. On every date, Travis had been quite the gentleman. I was getting ready in the apartment I share with Bren. I stood doing my hair. Over and over again. You look good, let it go, she said. I turned from the mirror and presented myself. You think? I said, twirling around in my new dress. You're hideous. Hilarious. Seriously, hun, you look amazeballs. She hugged me. Have fun at the lake. Try not to get too lucky. Hey, it's been a while, but not that long. Travis picked me up in his 1957 Plymouth Fury. It was a convertible. The thing looked like a shark that decided to crawl out of the ocean and start looking for meals on land. He tooted the horn as he pulled up. You look stunning, babe, he said. Ever the gentleman, he wouldn't let me into the car unless he got out and opened the door for me. Some old song was playing on the car radio. In fact, I don't think he ever listened to anything after the 50s. We headed out of town as the king sang on the radio. I can't get over your car, Travis, I said. It looks so good for its age. I'd take care of this baby. Means a lot to me. Sentimental value. I keep her cherry. Try to get maximum performance. He steps on the gas and we're moving a little too fast through town. I look at him nervously as he speeds up. Don't sweat it, Rose. I got this. Travis had started calling me Rose. Honestly, I didn't mind. He took my hand. I think today is going to be special. The lake looked beautiful in the summer sun as we walked to a nice secluded spot under a large tree. Travis left the car radio on. Down in the willow garden where me and my love did meet. He set down a large blanket. My dear, he said, ushering me to the blanket. We brought quite the selection of food. Travis popped open a bottle of wine. Was that weird for a picnic? He caught me making a face. 
Don't tell me you don't drink wine. No, just seems like a bit much for an afternoon picnic. Well, it's a celebration too, babe. It is? What are we celebrating? Five dates, I laugh. Okay, I'll drink to that. My love, she did not know. The song played on as he poured us each a glass of wine. We eat, and I take a couple sips of wine. I haven't had much in the way of wine, but this is really good. I wonder where he dug it up around here. As we eat, we talk, mostly about me. He always has so many questions. Every time I ask him something about him, he seems sad, almost on the verge of tears. I don't want to bring up any bad memories. As we talk, my head starts to feel light, which was a dreadful sign. What's up, Ronnie? Wow, uh, getting a head rush. I try to stand up, but my legs feel like rubber. Travis catches me as I come crashing back down. On the radio, the song keeps repeating. A dreadful sign. He brushes the hair out of my face and gives me a sad smile. I'm so sorry, doll. What? Sorry about... I stammer. My mouth doesn't want to move. I'm sorry. You have to die. All beauty must die. It's my curse. I summon up all my strength and push away from Travis. He tries to grab me and I scratch his face with my nails. Trying to stand again, I fall to my knees. The world begins shaking apart at the seams. My eyelids feel heavy. Every time I blink, it feels like it'll be my last. Maybe if I just sleep, it'll be better. I'll wake up from this nightmare. No, fight it. I start crawling on all fours, dragging myself, digging my nails into the ground. I have to get away. Have to fight. Have to get to the car. A dreadful sign. I see someone standing by Travis's car. I can't make them out. Why won't they? Help! Please! Rose, no one can help. I'm sorry. He grabs me by the leg, pulling me back. Travis turns me over, glaring at me. The scratches on his face aren't bleeding. I like playing with you, Rose, he said. But my dear, you're breaking my heart. (laughs) Fuck you! I try to hit him, but I have no strength left. Why won't that person do something? He stands up, pulling a large knife from his leather jacket. I could gut you, but that's no fun. Not anymore. He looks at his reflection on the knife blade. He adjusts his hair. I used to find his vanity cute. Bastard. The poison isn't killing you. Just making it hard for you to do anything. Why? Why not? I tried to move my head to see if that person was still standing there. A dreadful sign. Why is that song repeating? Is that an effect from the drugs? Travis notices me trying to look at the car. I can hear him talking to somebody, I I think. Go away, he says. You're not welcome here. He turns the radio off. Who was that? Who was he talking to? After what seems like hours, Travis comes back holding a large cinder block and rope. Comfortable, doll? Go to hell, I manage, my mouth starting to fail me. Travis just laughs. Be right back. He walks off, carrying the cinder block and rope. My mind races. Move! Move! But I can't. It's physically impossible. I try to will myself, picturing my spirit leaving my body, flying over the trees, finding Bren or my folks, telling them what's happening here. If I want it strong enough, I can make it happen. Run! Flee! I will my spirit to soar! He comes back, standing over me. He reaches down and grabs my legs. Going for a little trip, my beautiful rose? He drags me across the ground. I can see the grass ending as we go over a rocky area, but I can't feel any of it. I can't feel his hands on my legs, just just a great numbness. We go up a small hill near the beach. He stops dragging me. We're here. We don't have much time left together. He kneels down and touches my face, wiping away my tears. He pulls out two coins and puts one on each of my eyes. 
I blink my eyes and they slide off. He gets frustrated. Why did you do that? They're for your journey over. He takes them and sticks them in one of my hands, balling it into a fist. I see the cinder block with the rope tied to it near my feet. He crawls over to it and ties the rope to my legs. No, no, no. He's going to drown me. You've been a blast. He picks up the cinder block and walks to the edge of the hill overlooking the lake. I scream, but my throat fails me. I can barely make more than a crackling noise. He hefts the block up. He sighs, parting, sweet sorrow, and whatnot. He throws the block over the side and I can hear the rope quickly chasing after it, knowing that any second I'll be following it. And then I'm falling, followed by the slam of hitting the water. I sink, my lungs quickly filling with water. I welcome it. Please, let there be peace. I feel so tired. I just want it to be over. I can see the sunlight trickling down through the water. Darkness starts to creep into my vision. Until the light is swallowed by it. I wake, unable to move, my heart racing. Where am I? I'm in my room, laying on my bed. I hear a noise, a a crackling hiss, almost like static. My eyes catch movement in the darkness. The thing nears the edge of my bed. My heart pounds faster and faster. Am I having a heart attack? A low whispering hiss comes from the shade at the foot of my bed. Not a dream. Heed the sign. And then, the world went back to normal. I could move again. I wiped the sweat from my forehead. My heartbeat started to slow. I curled up in a ball on the bed, pulling the blankets over me. For the longest time, I I didn't move, fearing that that thing was waiting for me in the darkness. Eventually, I drifted off to sleep again. I woke and my room was lit by the light of early morning. Had it just been a dream? A nightmare? I get up, dangling my legs over the side of the bed. Was this all a nightmare brought on by being nervous? Over my big date with Travis? I stand in the shower almost in a trance as the water pours over me. I've taken plenty of showers before, but this just seems weird. The water feels like it's closing in on me. I I hear the jarring sound of static. Through the shower curtain, I see a dark shape move. The thing from my nightmare. It's back for me. I back against the shower wall. The wet tiles are cold against my back. I run my hands over them, looking for escape. A voice snaps me back to reality. You almost done, Bren says, annoyance in her voice. Water will be freaking cold. Sorry, almost done. I hear the door slam shut. All dread is faded away, and I just feel like a shit for hogging the shower. I get out and dry off quick, trying not to waste any more time. I leave the bathroom a towel wrapped around me. Bren is waiting for me by the door. You okay? Why? What were you doing in the shower so long? Daydreaming? Or a little... Pre-date gratification? I shoot her a look, and Bren does that laugh of hers. I'm sorry, Ronnie. I know you're all stressed. She gives me a kiss on the cheek and goes into the bathroom, shutting the door behind her. I hear the lock click. Guess I should have done that. At work, it's no easier. My mind drifts all day, thinking about our date this afternoon. The day moves in slow motion. What seemed like hours were, in fact, minutes when I looked at the clock and everything I did at work seemed like the wrong thing. Giving people the wrong order, spilling drinks. I shouldn't be this stressed over a date. No, it it was that dream, that, that nightmare. I consider calling the picnic off, but by the time my shift is over, I've reconsidered. Maybe I could turn this day around. When we get back to the apartment... I strip out of my waitress uniform and splash some water on my face. 
The water seems to engulf the room for the briefest of seconds, but the hallucination quickly fades. Am I losing my mind? The lake looked beautiful in the summer sun. We found a nice secluded spot under a large tree. Travis left the car nearby. He had the top down and the radio on. Down in the willow garden where me and my love did meet. He sat down a large basket. My dear, he said, ushering me to the blanket with a wave of his hand. We'd brought quite the selection of food. Travis popped open a bottle of wine. Was that weird for a picnic? He caught me making a face. Have we done this before? Don't tell me you don't drink wine. No, just seems a bit much for a afternoon picnic. Well, it's a celebration too, babe. My love, she did not know. I put my hand up. I'm sorry, but... I don't think I should. I'm feeling a little sick. Sick? Everything okay? I just had a rough night. Bad nightmare. He touches my hand. I don't know why this makes me flinch. He looks at me puzzled. What kind of nightmare? I think I was drowning and there was this figure there. When I woke up, I swear it was still there. You know, he starts pouring wine into the glasses. I think you need a little nip of wine, my rose. No, really, it's okay. It'll help your nerves. Okay, maybe just a little. Travis hands me one of the glasses. There's the sound of static cutting through the air, like someone's adjusting the radio. A dreadful sign. I look over at Travis's car and see it there. The thing from my nightmare... The glass of wine falls from my hand. It hits the ground, rolling and spilling all over the blanket. The song skips, or repeats. A dreadful sign. Not a dream, it said. Heed the sign. At first, I don't realize I'm screaming until I see Travis's face. He grimaces. He grabs me, clapping a hand over my mouth. He holds me so tight, I start to tear up. Shut the fuck up, would you? I try to pull away, but his hands are like iron clamps. I can see the anger in his eyes. He looks over to the thing standing next to the car. A dreadful sign. That's not going to help you, Ronnie, dear, he says, his voice never wavering. It's just an echo. As if robbed of its power, the thing evaporates into the air. He tightens his grip. Tears stream down my cheeks, soaking his hand. I see the wine bottle lying there, just out of reach of my free hand. I... I could hit him with it. Listen to yourself. You're gonna hit him? This is nuts. It has to be a game, right? No, it's not. I just need a weapon. T- to get away. I rake his face with my fingernails, scratching jagged lines down his face. For all the world, it sounded like running your nails over stone. He lets go of me, and I lunge for the wine bottle. As I reach for the bottle, he grabs me by the belt of my jeans. The bottle slips from my hands as he yanks me towards him, rolling just out of reach. I dig my feet and hands into the ground, pulling myself towards the bottle, the sun reflecting off of it. Like some magical weapon, it beckoned to me. My arms and legs burned as I strained. Almost, my fingers brushed off the smooth neck of the bottle. Why won't you let me help you, Travis says. Help me? I'm going to free you of all this bullshit. I manage a last bit of strength and grab the goddamn bottle. I swing it and hit him square in the side of the head. Unlike in the movies, the bottle doesn't break. Travis lets go of me. I hit him again and again. The bottle doesn't break. He falls to the ground, momentarily stunned. I bring the bottle down again on his head for good measure. This time, it shatters. I turn and run for his car. As I reach the car, Travis appears, pulling a large knife from his leather jacket. I didn't want to make a mess, Rose. He touches the wounds on his face. Gonna have to fix these. I slide into the driver's seat. Yes, the keys are there. I start the car. It roars to life. I hit the gas, aiming right for Travis. This is insane. Am am I in a never-ending nightmare? 
I ram into him, sending his body flying up onto the hood. He smashes through the windshield, his face contorted in a wicked smile. Hold hands, you lovebirds, he says. The car plunges into the lake. Water rushes in as we sink. The nightmare. I'm going to drown here. With him. A shard of broken window floats by me as we sink down. I grab it. The jagged edges cut into my hand. I take it, jabbing it into his eye. He lets go of me. He smiles at me as I push him away. I swim through the open top. For however long I live, I don't think I'll ever forget that smile. The jagged shard embedded in his eye. Travis and his car sinking to the bottom. I pull myself onto the beach. I think I pass out for a while, lying there in the dirt, soaking wet. I wake with a start and see a shadow fall across me. I look up and see that thing, the thing from my nightmare standing over me. Its face and arms are blue and bloated, its face vaguely feminine, its remaining hair rotten, hangs down in long strands. It wore a dress. My dress. Cats Out of the Bag by Morgan Moore The sound of tires screeching tore through the air as a Mitsubishi Lancer came to a sudden and jerky stop. Bursting out of the driver's side of the car came a girl of about 15. She made her way to the back of the car as her passenger, a girl as well, joined her. The two girls looked down at the ground and saw a black cat in rough shape. Its midsection had been crushed in and its brains oozed out. Oh shit, the former driver croaked out, panic flooding over her face. What's the matter? her friend asked. It's only a cat. No, it's not just a cat. It's my brother's cat, she explained as her face grew red and her voice jumped between panic and frustration. Oh, well, shit is right then. You're screwed, Michelle. Like I didn't figure that one out, Ariana, Michelle nearly shouted at her friend. It didn't take her long to figure it out at all. The cat had been living with Michelle and her family for a couple of months now. They had noticed it coming around the neighborhood and specifically that it was hanging around their house. Michelle's mom figured it was maybe because some old cat food from their last cat might still be in the yard, since it lived outside, or that it was just trying to find scraps from the garbage. Cats in general always seemed to roam around their neighborhood, and so they paid no attention to it. That is, until the darn thing somehow got itself stuck in their attic. Her dad managed to get it down, and once it saw her brother Mark, it became attached to him, and vice versa. Mark loved the cat, and never let it outside out of fear that it, which he later named Monk, would leave and never come back. To the credit of Mark and her parents, the cat was never let out, and they did everything they could to make sure it couldn't escape. Unfortunately, it seemed they didn't do the best of jobs today. Michelle didn't know how Monk got out. She could only guess that maybe she and Ariana didn't shut a door as well as they normally would in their rush to go meet up with some friends. No matter how the cat got out, it did, and in their focus on friends and fun, didn't pay attention as Monk began to cross the road in front of them. They only knew they had run over the poor cat as they did the deed. Damn it, what am I going to do? Michelle questioned. The two teenagers looked again at the cat, their stomachs churning at the grotesque image. Ariana was the first to break the silence. Just get rid of it. it. It's just a dead cat. Nobody saw us hit the stupid thing, so just throw it away somewhere and problem solved. Michelle looked at her friend in astonishment. You want me to just dump it? You want me to just dump my brother's cat? Her voice grew in anger. Well... Yeah, it's not like he'll know you did it. He'll figure it just ran away or something. You do realize how protective he is of that stupid thing, right? He goes ape shit if it even looks like it might escape or get hurt. Look, Ariana started in a soothing tone. Mistakes happen. Maybe we didn't close the door all the way. Maybe the wind blew it open enough for it to escape. Heck, you said the cat once got in your attic. 
Maybe it did a similar thing this time. Point being, shit happens and cats are tricky little shits. He will never know and never has to know. The two girls look down at the cat again, the image of its corpse becoming a bit easier to handle. Michelle had to admit that Ariana had a point. To the best of their knowledge, no one had seen them hit the cat, and even if they did, they wouldn't know whose it was. Michelle sighed and took a deep breath. You're right. Shit happens. Besides, cats tend to just... leave anyway, Michelle opined. See? Now you're thinking. Plus, it's a black cat. They're unlucky. Maybe it rubbed some of that bad luck on him. Ariana suggested, as a smile grew on her face. Hell, it crossed your path. Maybe you've been marked for bad luck now, she added with a small snicker. Oh, shut up and help me get rid of this stupid thing, Michelle returned. The two girls leaned down and picked up the cat, their faces twisted in disgust as the unfortunate animal's blood ran through their fingers and down their arms, a final warmth before the coldness of death. They moved quickly over to Michelle's car and put the cat in the back seat. Each girl gave a quick look around the area before getting in the car and speeding off. Later, the girls arrived on a secluded bike path and, once deep into it, threw Monk's body into a group of trees before running back to the car. Once inside, Michelle and Ariana looked at each other. After a moment, they nodded their heads and drove away, off to spend time with their friends. It didn't take long for Mark to notice. That night, when Michelle came home, he found her parents and Mark trying to hunt down the cat. Mark was in an outright frenzy. Her parents explained that Monk had somehow ran out from the house and they couldn't find her. They had driven and walked around the neighborhood and had even asked some of the neighbors. But neither they, nor anybody, knew where the cat may have gone. This brought some relief to Michelle, enough so that she was able to fall into a deep, guilt-free slumber that night. As the days went on, the search for Monk grew. Her folks put up posters throughout town and made posts on social media, asking friends to keep an eye out, and Michelle did so as well, never letting on that the cat's blood was on her hands. Mark, however, went from searching in a frenzy to searching in flat-out hysteria. He would stay up all night looking around the neighborhood, putting out her favorite treats to try to lure her back in. This led to him skipping school to continue the search, something which both the school and their parents became more than upset about. This resulted in Michelle's parents trying to rein in the grief, to regain the control, to make restrictions on the time allotted to searching for the feline. All this did was make Mark angrier at the situation. And while he would go to school, the random unprovoked fights he instigated proved he had nothing but hostility regarding the situation of losing his beloved cat. Days became weeks, and then weeks became a month, and no sign of Monk had yet to surface. Not that one ever would. It was at this point that Michelle and Mark's parents simply stopped looking and caring. They kept reminding people on social media about the reward, but the intensity they first had had vanished, and they simply came to the conclusion Monk was gone forever. Michelle went through the motions of her normal life, but the guilt was bubbling more and more as she watched her brother become more obsessed and depressed over Monk being gone. Whenever she and Ariana hung out, they would never bring it up, only acknowledging it every so often with a knowing look. Even in private, they never discussed it, save for Ariana asking how Mark was doing and leaving it at that. And so their days became ever more hellish. Mark was falling into a deep depression, and Michelle was overwhelmed with guilt and shame that continually churned inside her. Any cat she saw made her think of Monk. When she would be alone in the dark, she could swear she saw the cat moving in the darkness waiting for an opportunity to strike and exact revenge on her. Soon, it was becoming clear to her that she was falling into a pit of paranoia. In the back of her mind, she thought that it was due to the folly of her and Ariana, 
their rush to go meet with friends that gave Monk the chance to sneak out. At first, she would blame Mark for not teaching the dumb thing to not even approach a door, let alone to fear going back outside now that it had a home. But in the end, there was no clear sign as to how the door was able to open enough and why Monk decided to go out for a stroll. The only thing crystal clear was that it was Michelle who ran over the poor thing. It was Michelle who went along with the idea to simply just dispose of the body. It was Michelle who made the decision to not tell her parents what had happened, and it was she that made the decision to not tell her brother. No matter how she spun it in her head, no matter what Ariana told her, no matter what, it was purely and simply Michelle at fault and she was tired of the guilt she felt. After about two months of searching, Michelle decided it was time to come clean about the whole situation. She came home from school one day and saw a note from her parents saying that they'd be gone for the weekend to visit some relatives. The siblings were on their own. Michelle went upstairs to tell her brother about it and saw him sitting on his bed, his face distraught and filled with sadness. Now was the time to tell him. Michelle knocked on his door and her brother turned his head some to see what the cause of the noise was. Mind if I come in? No, Mark replied, solemnly, as he returned his gaze downward. Michelle walked over to his bed and sat down. She never really enjoyed being in her brother's room. It always smelled putrid, even with both him and mom going through cans of air freshener and wax melts. Her parents theorized it was due to Mark's room having a little crawl space that tended to catch a lot of water whenever it rained, and so the smell probably came from the rotting wood. Ariana had once said her brother's room smelled too, and that it's normal for all boys to have rooms that stink. Even if all that was true, Michelle doubted it could be as bad as this. Mom and Dad are gone for the weekend, so it's just the two of us. What do you want for dinner? She asked. I don't care her brother replied in a flat tone. Oh, uh, okay, Michelle replied. The two sat there in silence for a bit until Michelle caught a glimpse of her brother's face. His eyes were red from tears, something which she and everybody else who saw him had noticed on just about a daily basis. She had to tell him. Now was the time. It may have been better to wait until her parents returned, but she simply had to get it out, and now... Hey, Mark, Michelle squeaked out. Mark looked over at his sister, his face still painted in sadness. She took a big gulp and looked over towards the door of his room and began to tell him everything. From how she and Ariana ran Monk over, to how they disposed of the poor feline, and to how she hasn't told anybody until now about any of it. During the course of telling him, Michelle refused to even take a look at Mark out of fear of how he'd react and lose her courage to talk about it. Eventually, after about a half an hour, Michelle finished her story and took a deep breath. She turned to look at her brother afraid of the venomous anger he would more than likely have in his eyes. However, she did not find that. Instead, she found him still looking at the floor. The only change she could notice was that his expression was now one of blankness, drained of all emotion. This confused Michelle immensely. Where was the anger? The sadness? Nothing she expected and had prepared herself for was there. Mark, she began quietly, are you okay? Her younger brother took a deep breath and finally spoke out his tone normal as if he was speaking about the weather or some other boring, normal topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. This surprised her even more. Are you sure? Michelle stammered out. Yeah, it, it sucks. It really does. I loved Monk and, yeah, I'm mad about it, but I understand You were scared like anybody or any animal would be in a similar situation. I don't think I'll understand why you didn't come forward about it, but I get you were scared and probably didn't know how to tell me. I can't say I forgive you right now, but maybe down the road I can. 
Mark explained calmly and collectively, looking at his older sister while doing so. Michelle was utterly surprised by this. She was expecting a violent outburst of anger and grief, but instead she got this, just plain old-fashioned understanding. It just about brought her to tears, but she was able to control herself. All right then, um, well, I'm, I'm sorry for everything, really. I'll leave you alone now and let you know when dinner's ready. Michelle stood up and began to make her way out of the room. Before she could fully exit, though, Mark spoke up. Michelle, could you do me one favor, real quick, he asked. Sure thing. What do you need? She responded with a smile. Would you go spray some air freshener in the crawl space? It smells really bad. With a smile, she left the room and returned with a can of air freshener. Michelle made her way over to the closet and got on her hands and knees and pulled away a trunk Mark always kept in front of the door to the crawl space, most likely so that Monk would never get in there. She opened the door and a wave of foul odor assaulted her senses, It's smelling like something was dead in there. As she started spraying, though, Michelle looked inside of the crawl space, something which she had never done before. Her spraying stopped, and her face became awash with horror. Inside of the crawl space were the corpses of cats. Lots of them. Ones she could faintly recognize as previous cats the family had. Before she could fully react, Mark used her stunned state to his advantage and pushed her into the crawl space. Michelle's body sank some on the dead bodies, the odor overtaking her as she started to scream. Filled with panic, she tried to turn herself around towards the door, her hands pressing and clawing away at the corpses. Once she finally did turn herself around, she saw Mark, his face devoid of emotion, but his eyes filled with a gleeful anger. Don't worry, sis. I'll let mom and dad know you went out with some friends and, well, I didn't see you after that. Who knows? Maybe I'll tell the truth. Or maybe, just maybe, it's better if I act like my older, more mature sister. He spoke all of this with a contempt and joy in his voice she could not believe. Before she could even move an inch towards the door, Mark slammed it shut and moved the trunk back in its position as the doorstop and makeshift lock. He began to laugh as he did so. Michelle clawed at the door and screamed, but it wouldn't budge. She screamed and screamed and screamed as she slowly began to realize that this was her fate. That indeed, Ariana was right about Monk rubbing some bad luck onto her. That this crawl space, that this cat graveyard of her brother's, would be her new home. Forever. AIDS Mary by Rob Fields Raymond Burr reached his girlfriend's off-campus apartment. He looked at the tenant listings and pressed the buzzer button next to M. Wright. Moments later, he was buzzed in. He went down the hall to the corresponding apartment and knocked on the door. It opened shortly after. Raymond's girlfriend stood there, dressed in an oversized t-shirt. Anne, hi, Raymond said. Hey, she stepped aside to let him in. Raymond kissed Anne on the lips. Then it turned into a more passionate kiss. Anne began to moan a little. When Raymond felt her hands in his hair... He moved a hand to grope one of her breasts. Suddenly, Anne gasped. Raymond, stop, she commanded. When he wouldn't relent, she grabbed his hair. Get off of me, goddammit! When he realized that she was serious, he obeyed. She glared at him. Is this all you want from me when we're together? Is that all we are to you and your fucking fraternity brothers? Sex toys? He groaned in frustration. Jesus, Anne, what the fuck? You join a convent or something? It used to be you wanting to fuck all the time. Now you're all holier than thou. He groaned again. You've been like this for weeks. I'm trying to be patient, but I'm at my end. You want to break up? Anne started crying. I'm sorry, Raymond. 
I just don't think I can be sexual with you anymore. She looked at him sharply. Do you love me? Tell me the truth. He took a deep breath. You know I love you. I do. But you gotta tell me what's wrong. A long silence. I'm late. Late? What do you mean? Her glare was stronger. I'm late, as in, I missed my period, as in, I got pregnant. His eyes grew wide. You're pregnant? She went to the bathroom and returned with three sticks in her hand, two white and one pink. I got pregnant. Three different tests. He took the sticks from her, all showing plus signs. Then he looked back at her. You're sure? She glared at him again. You want me to take another test? You want to fuck me again just to make sure they're right? He threw the sticks down and grabbed her shoulders. That's enough. When he saw her fear, he quickly released her. Let's talk. What's there to say? She whispered. A long pause came. Why didn't you tell me sooner? Raymond asked. She groaned. I didn't want a baby. She wiped away tears, then pointed to the door. Get the fuck out. Without another word, she stormed into the bathroom and slammed the door. The lock clicked soon after. Raymond returned to his dorm. He wanted to comfort Anne, but he didn't know what to say. He couldn't bear to hear Anne sobbing behind her bathroom door. Suddenly, his smartphone rang. He answered it. What? Turn on the news, man. Do it now. Marcus, I don't have time for this. Mary's here. She's on our campus. Jeff's dead. Raymond quickly reached for the TV remote. He turned the news on and recognized the building where the news cameras were. It was the Delta Omega Kappa fraternity house on the other side of Strickfield University. As the reporter talked about the incident, the camera switched to a bedroom inside the house. Did you see it? On the mirror? It was in Carl's room, too! The camera stopped on the mirror and zoomed in. Raymond remembered hearing about this same message two days ago. The message was written in red lipstick. The words in the message were identical. Welcome to my world of AIDS. Hey, you still there, dude? Raymond found his voice. I'll be right over. Raymond met up with Marcus in front of the D.O.K. house. Just seeing his look of horror sent a shiver down his spine. Marcus grabbed his arm. The rest of us are over at Masterson Hall. The two fraternity brothers walked to the other side of campus. When they entered the building, Raymond saw that there were only two others there. When they stopped, Raymond turned to Marcus. You said the rest of us were here. This is the rest of us, Raymond. Carl was on the news two days ago. The cops found his body at the Lemley Hotel off the main highway. The gun was in his hand and the rest of his head was all over the fucking walls. Carl saw Mary's message on the mirror and he blew his heads off. AIDS Mary. Raymond wanted to laugh. AIDS Mary? Then he regarded all of them. How do you people know her fucking name? Is there something you want to tell me? You should be afraid too, James Clark stammered. She'll come for you too. She'll come for all of us, Marv Vernon added. Ain't no coincidence she got Carl, then Jeff. He stood up. That fucking bitch has AIDS, and now she wants to give it to us? We know what she looks like, but she still got Carl and Jeff to fuck her anyway. Raymond raised his hand. How do you know she screwed them? Were you there? Their bodies were found... Naked, Marcus said. Didn't you watch the report on Carl? Why would she put that fucking message on the mirrors? She definitely fucked both of them. Raymond was frustrated. Assholes, you need to talk to me. Why is this AIDS Mary after everybody in our fraternity? A brief silence. Then one of them said, We raped her. Raymond's heart dropped into his stomach. What? I said we raped her. That's what I thought you said. 
Raymond took a deep breath. Okay, tell me more. Marcus sat down with the others. Earlier this semester, while we were taking a makeup exam, we went out looking for girls. We found this high school chick in a bar, drunk as shit. We brought her back to the house. We felt playful and started touching her. When she backed off, we grabbed her and took her down to the floor. She wasn't as drunk as we thought since she tried fighting us off. Raymond groaned. Un-fucking- Believable. Except it wasn't just her, it was them. As in, it wasn't just Mary. Raymond's jaw dropped. Jesus Christ, how many girls did you rape that night? Three? Five? A hundred? Two, Marv replied. Just two. Raymond faked a smile. Okay, you raped two girls. Where'd you get the other one? A girl saw us through a window. She ran, but we caught her and, uh... I can't believe this shit! Raymond roared in anger. So, another girl saw you, was gonna blow the whistle, and... What happened after you finished with her? We took Mary back to her high school and left her there. The other girl ran off. We were all still drunk, so we don't really remember what she looked like. Raymond waved his hand, frantically. Okay, how do you know it's this AIDS Mary? How do you know it's not the other girl? Marcus handed Raymond a letter he had been holding. Open it. Raymond opened the envelope and removed the paper. It was the results of a hospital AIDS test, which was positive. The recipient was Mary Richter. Raymond gave the items back. Okay, but what I really want to know, which one of you motherfuckers gave it to her? The guys looked at each other in bewilderment. Raymond laughed scornfully. Are you fucking serious? He calmed down. You shit heels raped two girls. You have a hospital report saying one of them's got full-blown AIDS. It never occurred to you that one of you has it? There were no replies. Raymond sighed. Okay, I'll add something. You dumbasses probably all have it now. You all took turns with Mary, right? When the others looked at each other in horror, he knew he had them. You gotta get your sorry asses to a hospital, stat. If you all have AIDS, you know why. Raymond raised his finger. Then, turn yourselves into the police and confess to everything. AIDS Mary's still out there, right? She knows you shitheads, what you did to her. You'll all be lipstick on mirrors eventually. Me? I'm leaving. I got problems of my own, and I'm done with this fucking fraternity. AIDS Mary ain't coming for me since I wasn't in on the rape. Have a nice life, gentlemen. Without another word, Raymond left Masterson Hall and walked back to his dorm. A week later, Raymond was in his room, still trying to talk to Anne. This time it was on a video chat. Clearly, she was still down about her pregnancy. Not wanting to talk any further, she disconnected on him. He decided to turn on the news. He nearly dropped the remote when he saw the top story. Like the other D.O.K. brothers, James had been found in his room, wrist slit. A familiar message was written on the full-length mirror and lipstick. Welcome to my world of AIDS. Raymond turned off the TV and raced to see if the other frat brothers were still alive. When he reached the fraternity house, he ran inside and shouted for them. No reply. He raced upstairs. When he reached Marv's room, he looked in. The room was empty. He moved to Marcus's room. Empty. Now he was worried. From past experiences, he knew there was always a frat brother at the house. Raymond moved through the rest of the house. As he was about to leave, he remembered the basement and headed to that door. Upon reaching it, he opened the door and flipped the light switch. Nothing. He turned and headed to the kitchen. He flipped the switches there. Nothing. 
He went to a drawer and pulled out a knife. He returned to the basement and descended slowly. Once off the bottom step, he looked around uneasily. He saw the back room and walked quietly towards it. He peeked in and saw that Marcus was tied to the bed. In his boxers. When Marcus saw him, his eyes widened and he made a muffled sound. Raymond raced to Marcus and removed the tape from his mouth. Marcus, what the fuck? Marcus shrieked. It's her, Raymond! She's here! Hi, boys, another voice called out from nearby. A few seconds later, the intruder, a female, stepped out from behind a full-length mirror. Mary Richter, Raymond cried. She was wearing very sexy, revealing lingerie. In the flesh, she purred. She looked at Raymond. I don't believe I know you. Suddenly, she raised her finger. Wait a minute. You're Raymond. Your name's on the charter. You shouldn't have come here. But I guess it doesn't matter. I would have found and killed you anyway. For what? Raymond demanded. You belong to this fucking fraternity. Okay, you weren't here when I was raped, but you are a brother. I got the others. You're the last one. He heard Marcus say, Yeah, Raymond, she just screwed me. She gave me that shit she's carrying. You people gave me this shit, Mary shouted, when you raped me. Raymond raised his hands. How did you get everybody if they already knew who you were? Wasn't hard, she laughed at her success. You guys only think with your dicks, right? It was so easy to use shit from the theater department at my school. I could be a completely different girl with a wig, different clothes, stuffing my bra. Then I just found the bastards and fucked them. The easiest part of all. She took hold of the mirror and turned it around. Raymond and Marcus read the same message, written in lipstick. Welcome. To my world of AIDS. This message can work for you too, Raymond, Mary said. She then produced a gun and pointed it at him. I won't fuck you. You two can have a suicide pact. At least, that's what the police will think. Don't do this, Raymond begged. Why? Mary snapped. You didn't rape me, but that doesn't mean you get a pass. You'll leave here and call the police. Those motherfuckers raped me that night, she shouted now. I had my whole life ahead of me. I'm not even out of high school, and your fucking fraternity brothers brought me here and raped me. I cried, begged them to stop. They totally destroyed me, made me bleed, made sure I would never have a life. I'm dying, Raymond. There's no cure. So I'm getting my revenge before I die. Why do you need to kill me then? Raymond fired back. I was clear on the other side of campus that night. I would have never let these guys rape you, he sighed. I'm not apologizing for these bastards. Raymond, Marcus started. Fuck you, Marcus. Mary's right. You fuckers got exactly what you deserved. Raymond dropped the knife. You want to kill me? Then I hope you can explain to my girlfriend and my unborn child why. Mary's mouth opened a little. You have a girlfriend, and you're having a baby? She put the back of her hand on her forehead. I really feel sick. I think I'm going to die soon. I haven't taken any medications. I couldn't afford any, especially after my parents kicked me out. I don't want to live like this. She lowered the gun and sniffled again. Would you really have stopped these guys that night? If I would have been here that night, you're damn right I would have. He started to move toward the couch. When she quickly raised the gun, he raised his hand. I'm just getting this blanket. She lowered the gun. He picked up the blanket and shook it open. He approached Mary and draped it around her. She took it and finished covering herself. After she did, she moaned and collapsed. Raymond caught her and lowered her to the floor. I'll call for an ambulance, he told her. What's the point? Mary choked and began to cry. Why? She looked up at the ceiling. Why did they have to kill me? Raymond eased Mary into his arms 
and let her cry as much as she wanted. He really felt horrible inside. True, he wasn't involved with the rape, but as part of this fraternity, he felt he might as well have been. He took the gun away from Mary without a struggle. Then he pulled out his smartphone and called 911. Hours later, Raymond returned to his dorm. He found Anne sitting on the bed. For the first time in so long, she smiled for him. Anne? I just saw the news. You stopped AIDS Mary. She took his hand. Are you okay? I know I've been so awful to you these last few months, and I'm so sorry. Raymond sat with her. He squeezed her hands. I love you so much, Anne. I'm ready to be a father for our baby. I'm here for you. She leaned forward and kissed him. After several kisses, she pulled her sweatshirt off. Let's make love. He looked astonished. Are you sure? She undid the button on the front of her bra and exposed her breasts. Soon they undressed each other and got under the sheets. Falling asleep together was the last thing that Raymond remembered. In the morning, Raymond woke up. Anne was gone. Next to him was a flash drive with a note taped to it. Play me. He picked it up, went to his computer. After inserting the drive, the video appeared. It was Anne. Hi, Raymond. Before I go any further, I left an envelope on the desk. Look inside. He turned and found the envelope. He opened it and found a hospital result sheet, similar to Mary Richter's. As he looked it over, he saw that it was a pregnancy test. Then he felt a second page just underneath it. He looked the page over. It was a second test. And then, his jaw dropped. Anne talked, as if on cue. Yes, Raymond, now you know why I didn't want to sleep with you these past few months. I was pregnant, and... It wasn't yours. I really did want to have a baby with you, so I went off the pill. Our anniversary came, I stopped by your fraternity to get you. Then I remembered you were taking your makeup exam. As I was leaving, I heard a girl crying out. I discovered your brothers raping that poor girl. One of them saw me and I ran. They caught me and pulled me into the house. Your brothers raped me too, Raymond. She wiped away a tear. They gave me AIDS and got me pregnant that night. Mary rightfully killed those motherfuckers. I ended up having an abortion since the baby would have been born with the disease. But I've got a new purpose now. From now until I die, I am going to sleep with as many men as I possibly can. You men violated me and basically killed me. What I once did for you out of love, I do so now in revenge. AIDS Mary will live on, Raymond. Or don't you remember my full name? He gulped, looked down at her test results. He read the name carefully. Mary Ann Wright. Then he looked back at the monitor. One final thing, Raymond. Look at the bathroom mirror. She blew him a scornful kiss to end the video. He stood up and raced to the bathroom. He turned on the light and saw the message on the mirror in the same shade of lipstick. Welcome to my world of AIDS. The Dinner Guests by Shane Migliavaca. Orville Trench admired his reflection in the car window. He missed his long black ponytail and beard. His hair was cut short now. He ran a hand over his smooth chin. He'd had that beard so long, it was like cutting off a limb. But it had to go. It was time to get a new car, too. The old one would be drawing too much attention soon. Cherry Kowalski, the love of his life, appeared in the reflection. Her eyes were large, piercing, and dark. Dark to match her long, wild black hair, streaked with purple and green, that hung to her shoulders. She twirled one of the long strands of hair around her index finger. Hanging around her neck was a simple silver necklace, a small plastic baby arm dangled from it. 
You look good, she said. I didn't ask. Fuck you, she laughed loudly, giving her lover double middle fingers. Orville spun around, grabbing her by the shoulders. His eyes narrowed. Oh yes. Yes indeed. He scanned the parking lot of the convenience store. There were only three cars here. An old pickup truck, a rusting black Camaro, and a fairly new SUV. Not much to pick from. Shouldn't be that many people inside. He looked at the sign over the door. It read, Quick Save Mart. It would be quick, all right. He couldn't wait to get out of East Fuckwit, New York. Orville touched the cold steel under his jacket. A Colt Trooper MK3, like the sheriff carried in Walking Tall, the 70s one. He loved that film. Not that shit remake with that Nancy Boy wrestler. It hung from a shoulder holster under his jacket. A flaming devil face was emblazoned across the jacket's back. Just as he expected, the door had a little bell that chimed when it opened. He sized up the store. Orville liked to think of himself as a hunter, though what he hunted, you didn't buy a license for. The store was typical. Five aisles of various overpriced crap, cold drinks in the back, and some not-so-fresh-looking coffee. The kid behind the counter, who couldn't be older than 20, didn't even look up from his cell phone when they entered. He was dressed to the nines in M&M cast-offs. Another white boy wannabe. He'd be easy enough. Picking through the beer was a bear of a man. Dirty coveralls, baseball cap, and a long graying beard. Had to be the pickup driver. This one could be trouble. He'd be the first. The last customer was a young woman. Mid-twenties. Two in the afternoon and she's wearing fucking pajamas. Orville shakes his head. Too bad for her. She wasn't his type. Anything look good for you, hun? He asks Cherry. Slim pickings. The big man came up to the counter, carrying two six-packs. He set them on the counter. It took a couple seconds before the kid looked up from his phone. That all, Mr. Scott? The kid asked. For now. You know that damned phone gonna turn you into a zombie, Jimmy. All you kids just stare at him all the time, sucking your minds out. Not just kids doing it. Seen plenty of adults, too. Scott opens his wallet. Goddamn right about that. The wife is always doing that Facebook shit. Why you think I got these for tonight? The two have a laugh. Cherry makes a mock vomiting face to Orville. Orville mouths, which one? Cherry nods towards large Mr. Scott. Gonna start off Friday night, right? Scott says. Cherry slides up next to him. She leans against the counter, showing Jimmy her cleavage. His eyes go right to it. How's about speeding up all the talky-talky, she says. Excuse me, young lady, Scott says. No need to be fucking rude. Orville stood next to the coffee pot watching Cherry do her thing. He poured himself a cup, dropping in a ton of creamer and sugar, gulping down the cup in one go. I just want to make a purchase and go, not listen to your fucking life story, she says, noticing she's not even holding anything. Cherry quickly grabs a handful of Slim Jims. These delicious treats, yum yum. Scott shakes his head and turns back to Jimmy. What do I owe you? Orville lets his eye flicker over the female shopper. She'd selected some chips and now stood in front of the soda cooler, oblivious to the fun up front. Scott paid Jimmy and turned to leave, picking up his beer. Cherry blocked his way. Excuse me, miss. No, no, you don't get to leave until you apologize. Cherry stomped her booted foot hard on the floor. Just get out of my way, crazy bitch. He tried to push past her. Angry, Cherry clawed him, opening red trenches on the left side of his face. Bitch! Scott dropped both of his six-packs to the floor with a crash. Some of the cans exploded in a foamy blast. He made an unsuccessful grab at Cherry. (laughs) Too slow, she laughed. Scott lunged at Cherry only to come face to face with Orville's Colt Trooper. Orville smiled, a wicked smile, as he pulled the hammer back. Hands off my girl. He pulled the trigger, sending Scott's brains all over the newspaper rack. 
Scott fell to the ground, twitching. Lying on his back, Orville fired a couple more shots into the dying man's chest. He saw Jimmy behind the counter, his face slack with dull horror. Orville pointed the colt at him. Stay planted right there, zit boy. You move, you die. The boy nodded. Shit, Ori, he was mine, Cherry pouts. And you took too long. The female shopper screamed at the top of her lungs and bolted. Orville sighs. Get her. Cherry let out a blood-curdling scream and pursued her prey. Cherry grabbed cans from one of the shelves and hurled them at the woman. Where you going, baby? A can hit one of the glass coolers, cracking it. Another one hit the woman's leg. She fell against a display of dog biscuits, knocking it over with a loud crash. Cherry picked up a loaf of bread and beat the woman with it. Give up, she laughed, pulling the woman up by her hair. Orville watches the sad spectacle, laughing. Out of the corner of his eye, Jimmy inches towards his phone on the back counter. Don't even think about it, white chocolate. Cherry marched the pajama-clad shopper up to the counter. Upon seeing Scott lying on the ground in a pool of blood, the captive started to sob. Oh God, don't hurt me. Orville looked at the woman. Don't worry. Nobody's getting hurt as long as you give us a little ride. A glint of metal caught his eye. Too late, he saw Jimmy aiming a cheap pistol at him. The nervous boy squeezed the trigger, trying to fire one-handed. The pistol fired wild. The bullet whizzed past Orville and hit the female shopper in the throat. Orville took aim with the colt and blasted Jimmy between the eyes. The boy slumped dead against a display of lotto tickets. Damn, Orville says. That was something. Orville looked over at the side of the counter at Jimmy, what brains he had leaking out of the wound above his eyes. Orville shot him again. You get to have all the fun, Cherry pouts. He holsters the colt. Get some supplies for the road. Orville walked over to the body of the woman. He crouched down and turned her on her back. She stares up at him with lifeless eyes. He rummages through her pajama pockets and pulls out a pair of keys. He was about to stand when a bell dinged as a car pulled up to one of the pumps. He looked back at Cherry filling up a plastic bag with groceries. Get down, he hissed. We've got company. Orville peeked around an end cap of beef jerky. It was hard to make out the car or the driver since they were on the other side of the gas pumps, but he thought he saw a glimpse of long blonde hair. All the while Orville kept his eyes on the new arrival, they stepped from behind the pump. He was right. It was a girl, about 18, long blonde hair, longer legs. Instantly, Orville felt his crotch come alive. God damn, he wanted to fuck her on the spot. This called for a change of plans. He'd planned on taking the woman in pajamas hostage, having her drive them somewhere secluded and lie low. But white chocolate got trigger happy and fucked that up so he'd settle for just taking her car and some supplies and hightailing it. But now Blondie had dropped into their laps, and if he was lucky, she'd be riding it later tonight. After he was done, Cherry could have a go. She'd like that. Orville licked his lips at the thought. From behind the counter, another urgent beep as the blonde pressed a button on the pump. Finally giving up, she walked frustrated towards the store. Here we go, Orville whispered. The blonde pulled the door open, making the bell chime as she unknowingly stepped into hell. Jimmy, you awake in here? She asked a second before seeing the blood. Jimmy? Nope, Orville stood. The colt pointed at her. Jimmy's on break. Blood? The girl said, biting her lip. Did you? Sure did, Cherry said, as she walked towards them carrying an overstuffed bag of groceries. How sweet! Fresh meat. She's also going to be our ride out of here. Ain't you, baby? The girl looked down at the bodies, then up at Orville and Cherry, dumbstruck. Right? Orville said, a bit annoyed. He took the blonde's chin with his hand and forced the girl to nod in agreement. Right! He took his hand away, leaving bloody fingerprints. Who are you? The girl asked, her voice quivering. I'm a demon, Orville answered. Straight from hell, I eat up little girls like you. You're going to kill me. Depends. What's your name, sweetness? 
Lauren. Lauren Doler. Well, Lauren, where were you headed this fine afternoon? The girl took a deep breath. To my parents for dinner. To her parents for dinner, Cherry mocked. And where do said parents live? You don't want to go there, please. I'll take you anywhere else. Orville snapped his fingers. Where do they live? I don't want anybody to get hurt, she offered up. Orville snapped his fingers again. Where? Defeated, she sighed. Outside Hillbury, on Old Gorge Road. Sounds homey. Just the folks there, sweet pea? Yes, only child. He grabbed her ass. Great, let's mount up. Road trip, Cherry said, doing a little dance. Lauren looked down at the dead bodies. You're just gonna leave them there? Like that? Cherry looked down at the bodies. They're dead, honey. They ain't got anything to worry about. Now move your ass. They filled up the gas tank of Lauren's Chevrolet hatchback and loaded up the back with several bags of groceries. Orville had formulated a new plan. They'd go to the parents' house, maybe spend a day or two laying low. This massacre would be all over the news. He could take the time to have some fun with Lauren. Orville looked over the car. We're all set, sweet pea. You know the way. You drive. Shotgun! Cherry shouted. Sorry, hun. I gotta keep an eye on our driver. You'll have to ride in the back seat. Oh, fuck! Cherry kicked the car tire. I never get shotgun. Orville slid into the passenger's side and glanced at the blonde. She had her blood-stained fingers near her mouth. Did she just lick the blood? No, no, couldn't be. Just a trick his eyes played on him. Orville watched the trees on both sides of the road pass by. Their branches stretched out towards him like skeletal arms. It wasn't fall yet, but all the trees had lost their leaves. What's with the trees? he asked out loud to nobody in particular. Lauren, who was focused on the road, answered him. That's because of the original Hillberry. There was a chemical spill back in the 80s. Shit, really? Cherry said, poking her head in from the back seat. This spooked Lauren, whose hand slipped on the wheel. Easy there, girl, Orville said. He slipped his hand to Lauren's bare leg, running his hand up under her skirt. Can't have you crashing. Cherry slapped Orville on the shoulder. Lay off. Let her tell the story. Orville's hand moved away from Lauren's leg, allowing her to pull her skirt back down. There's no real story. Just some company spilled a bunch of chemicals near the town, killed all the trees and grass, poisoned the water. A few people got sick. All the townsfolks moved to New Hillbury. She pointed past Orville. You can see part of the old town there, through the trees there. Orville and Cherry turned. As the dead trees flew by, a few dilapidated houses could be seen, weathered, abandoned, and forgotten to time. Your parents live all the way out here? It'll be much easier that way, away from prying eyes. Orville smiled at this thought. No need to worry about all the screaming. My parents like it out in the country away from the hustle and bustle. They're, they're a little old-fashioned. Orville let his eyes wander to the girl's chest. Her tits were nicely sized. He got hard as thoughts of burying his face in them ran through his mind. Not you, though, huh? You like the tight, tight, cramped modern world. That's a hell of a commute for Daddy, Cherry piped in. Cherry knew what he was thinking, and it pissed her off. He could tell. Dad kind of works from home. Lucky him, Orville said. He looked at the sky growing dark as the evening crept in. The car sank into quiet as Orville turned his thoughts to what had to be done. The parents shouldn't be too hard to control, especially since he had the girl and the gun. Besides, in a day or two, the happy family would be dead as dog shit. Orville looked at the girl, seeing her as yet another decayed corpse left in his wake. Too much quiet! Cherry barked from the back seat. Turn on some tunes, Ori. Good idea, he said. He turned on the radio, cycling through the channels. Most of it was static. The first actual station he got was a religious one, 
a woman was preaching, screaming the words in a frenzy, Exodus 4.25, you are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. The woman's voice was raw, like her throat was bloody. Ah, nope, Cherry interjected from the back seat. The next station he found was a pop station. Dubstep strained the car's speakers. Hell fucking no! The next station, Kenny G was playing his heart out. Crap, next! Orville switched it again. Black Sabbath's paranoid assaulted their eardrums. Hell yeah! Cherry squealed. It was dark before they got to the house. Lauren drove without the headlights on until Orville said something. She was so nervous she must have forgot to turn them on. I can take you anywhere, she pleaded. Please, just don't involve my parents. Really, I'm sorry, sweetness, but no. Even if he somehow took pity on her, it was too late now anyway. On the left side of the road, a large house loomed, lights burning quaintly in the windows. This had to be the place. It was the first man-made structure they'd seen in miles. Lauren pulled off the road down on a long dirt driveway. Off to the house's right, a large walled-in cemetery loomed, its stone walls, ancient and crumbling. Whoa, creepy, Cherry said, pressing her face to the window. A graveyard? Your parents live next to a fucking graveyard? Orville asked. Dad's the caretaker, Lauren answered, as she pulled up to the house. When the town moved, the cemetery stayed. They still bury people from the new town here. They got out of the car. Orville glanced up at the house. It looked old, but in pretty good condition. Daddy probably had a lot of time on his hands to keep the place nice. Won't Mom and Dad be surprised, Cherry said, doing a little skip. Lead the way, Princess. Orville reached into his jacket and pulled out an old switchblade. He held the blade to Lauren's side. Don't think of being a hero. This old girl is Sally. Killed my first dog with her. She'll gut you all the same. Understand? Yes. Good. Let's go meet the folks. Lauren pushed open the door, Orville right behind her. The house looked homey, he thought. Would be a shame to make a mess of it. Mom? Dad? I'm here! Orville could hear a TV playing in one of the rooms. The smell of something good cooking hung in the air. A middle-aged couple stepped into the room, Their looks of joy turned to questioning looks upon seeing their guests. Honey, who are these people? the mother asked. The father looked at Orville, the recognition visible on his face. Look who's come to dinner, daddy dear, Orville says. Behave, he flashes the colt in its holster. Oh, God, mom stammered. What do you want? Some grub would be cool. They're the ones on the news. Serial killers, Lauren's father said. Has our little rest stop made a splash already? Orville said, putting his arm around Lauren. He could see the father's face light up with anger, and then helplessness. This thrilled Orville to no end. Orville might have to make Daddy watch as he fucked the girl's brains out. Why don't we mosey into the dining room and eat? Mom and Dad led the way, as Orville walked with Lauren, Cherry following behind. "'What are we having, Mom?' Orville asked. "'Roast, but it's still in the oven,' she answered, looking nervously at her husband. "'I should get it.' "'Cherry, why don't you help Mom get the food?' Orville winked at the mother. "'I'll entertain Pops.' Cherry frowned. "'Come on, you old bat!' she took the woman roughly by the arm. "'Where's the kitchen?' Orville pulled Lauren tight to him. He took a whiff of her hair and skin. Your daughter smells great, Daddy. Ever have a piece? He could see the hate burning in the man's eyes. Orville half wanted him to try something. He ran his hand roughly over Lauren's chest. Bet she tastes great, too. As he hoped, this was too much for Dad. Orville pushed Lauren out of the way and sent the girl sailing into a small stand. The father charged at Orville, swinging at him with his huge fist. Orville sidestepped the swing and grabbed the man by the throat. He slammed him down hard against a nearby table. The mother appeared in the doorway, Cherry right behind her. Get the fuck back in the kitchen, Cherry! Cherry did as she was told, pulling the woman back to the kitchen. Orville pulled out Sally and sliced a large gash 
across the man's right cheek. Bad dad. He took a quick glance at Lauren. Hey, princess, where's the basement? Lauren stood, unsure on her feet. Please don't hurt them. Just, just go. Not gonna happen. Basement now, or daddy loses an eye. Lauren led them to the basement door and nervously opened it. What are you gonna do? Lauren pleaded. Orville dragged her old man to the stairs. All Orville could see were some old wood stairs descending into darkness. Can you fly, Daddy? Orville took the man by the collar and threw him down the stairs. Lauren screamed her guts out as her father was swallowed up by the darkness. Orville thought he heard the sound of bones breaking as the man hit bottom. He looked at Lauren, tears streamed down her cheeks. It's possible he survived. Maybe, she sobbed. Why? Orville licked his lips. You don't want Mom to get the treatment, do you? No. Good. You'll do what I say then. She nodded. Here's what I want. He knew she'd still have a room here. The kid moves out, but the folks always keep the room untouched. Stuffed animals sat on the bed, silent judgment on their furry faces. Orville turned on the radio on the girl's dresser. Stevie B's Postman song was on. Not sexy, but Orville didn't want to wait anymore. He pushed the stuffed animals off the bed, scattering them to the floor. He hopped on the old bed, its springs creaking in protest. Okay, sweet pea. Showtime. Strip. Lauren gulped. Cherry watched the mom trying to prepare dinner like all hell hadn't just broke loose in the other room a few minutes ago. She had to hand it to the old bat. She could keep it under control. It had grown quiet now. What could be going on? Cherry thought. Before she investigated that, the smell of the roast caught her limited attention span fully. Cherry stabbed a big slice of it with her knife and took a large bite, sending juices dribbling down her chin. So good, Mommy, she said. I think I just came in my panties. The woman didn't answer. She cut off a slice to replace the one Cherry took. Beef or pork, Cherry asks. I can't nail the taste. Putting down the carving knife, Mother cleaned off her hands with a towel. Pork. It's damn good, Mom. Why do you do it? Hurt people. Cherry thought for a moment. Because it's something to do. Lauren stood in her bra and panties, nervously trying to emulate a sexy dance. Orville watched. It was time. He could wait no longer. Come here. She walked toward him, her face pale white. Orville was a little bit disappointed in her choice of plain pink panties and bra. He'd hoped they'd be something a little more exciting, or at least funny. Lauren sat down next to him, her body shaking. Undo my pants. Cherry was getting a little nervous. Where was Ori? She didn't hear anything out in the dining room. Maybe Orville was getting rid of the dad. She watched Mother as she washed the carving knife. When can we go out there? She asked. The food'll get cold. Just hold your horses. Don't you have any other food to get ready? It was weird. The whole time they were in the kitchen, she didn't see the woman prepare anything else. No vegetables, no potatoes, no stuffing, nothing. Did they only eat meat? The meat had made her thirsty. Cherry walked over to the fridge. She could go for something cold. It was too much to hope these fucks had beer. She pulled open the fridge door. Sitting there, on a large plate, was a severed human arm with a rather large chunk cut out from it. Cherry suddenly felt very weak. Behind her came noises no human ear should ever hear. The sound of flesh and bone stretching, moving. She spun around. The woman looked different now, her skin grayish, her eyes black. Long teeth protruded from her mouth, and her hands had become claws. We can't eat just any flesh, she growled. It has to be dead first, the father said, standing in the door. He was a little bloodied, but looking very much like his wife did now. The only thing between Orville and Lauren was his boxers and her underwear. He felt like a boy on Christmas morning. 
He told Lauren to pull down his boxers. They fell to the floor. Here, he took her head, lowering it toward his excited dick. He leaned his head back, looking up at the ceiling. The girl was pretty good at this. There was a gunshot somewhere downstairs, followed by Cherry screaming in horror. What the fuck? But it was already too late. In the next instant, pain sliced through him. He felt something warm splash his chest. He was almost too terrified to look down. His crotch was covered in warm, red blood. The small stump where his dick had been was busy pumping more out. As he started to slip into shock, he looked at Lauren, whose body was undergoing a horrible change. She spat blood from her mouth along with his severed manhood. I told you to leave us alone. Orville could hear the heavenly chorus calling him. They sounded like howling wolves. Savior of the Sea by Splatter Joe Salma Hannah dove behind the stainless steel cart in the hotel kitchen. The hissing sound continued in the hallway. She could see the shadow of the thing under the door where the hall light invaded the room. Revulsion rose inside her, and she placed her hand over her mouth, fearing an imminent vomit. How did this day turn into this? she asked herself. How does something like this happen? Two days ago, she arrived in Portland for a dental convention. The hotel staff had been all friendly with her, and the doorman, the desk clerk, and even the maids wore a smile on their faces that first day. She went to the convention and sat through boring seminars all day and only wanted to return to her room for a long soak in the tub. But something had gone seriously wrong. The lobby was dark when she arrived. She used her cell phone to light her way towards the stairs. About halfway across the green carpet, she almost fell when she stepped in something wet. The carpet sloshed under her feet. She heard a groan behind the desk and made her way there by LED torchlight. There she found the clerk, laying behind the mahogany counter, clutching his stomach. She could see the red stains spreading on his white shirt. I'll call for help, she whispered, but the clerk tugged on her leg with a bloody hand. Run, he said, and the look in his eyes sent shivers down Hannah's spine. She turned back towards the door, and that was when she first caught a glimpse of it. The body was slick with moisture, translucent, and almost amorphous in design. But her eyes didn't fixate on its body. It had long appendages, two on each side where arms should be, but these looked more like tentacles. They had to be at least ten feet long and flopped across the wet carpet like an unmanned fire hose. Its face reminded her of a squid, with a beak located centrally. It had no eyes on its slick face. She caught glimpses of sharp yellowish teeth when it opened its maw. Two thick squat legs held the atrocity upright, ending in clawed feet with three toes. It screeched at her sounding like a movie version of a pterodactyl. It was blocking the door. There was nowhere to escape. She ran towards the back, behind the counter, passing the dying clerk on the way. He still clutched his stomach. She passed through the doorway into a hall leading to some banquet rooms the hotel used from time to time. She saw the sign for the kitchen at the end of the hall and ran towards it. Now, that creature had followed her. She whispered a prayer that it wouldn't come in the kitchen where she was hiding, but she saw its tentacles slide across the floor and push against the double swinging door. With a push, the door swung open and the creature probed the dark room with its tentacles. A nauseating smell reached Hannah as she tried not to freak out. She glances behind her looking for a way out. She carefully backed around the counter, looking over her shoulder as the tentacles grew closer and closer to her, probing for its prey. Her feet struck something solid, and she turned to find a counter behind her. Hanging on the edge was a magnetic strip with knives. She grabbed the biggest one she could find. Her eyes darted along the wall, and she saw the exit sign above a side door. She started to make her way along the tiled floor. She nearly jumped out of her skin when the tentacles of the monster struck the cart she had hid behind earlier. 
sending it crashing into the wall. She had to consciously keep herself from screaming. As she approached the door, she saw through the center island the creature in the aisle next to her. Its beak snapping at air as its ten-foot tentacles grasped anything it could. It knew she was in here, somewhere. It turned its eyeless face in her direction and screeched, sending a shower of black, sickly liquid onto her. A feeling of dread overcame her and she tried to move, but it was like she was glued to the floor. She fought the feeling, the lethargy settling in her bones like sand filling an hourglass. The longer she was there, the harder it was getting. A tentacle came over the countertop, sending pots skittering on the floor near her feet, and this time, a small yelp escaped her lips. The creature turned in her direction and stepped onto the counter with surprising agility. All four tentacles were now probing this side of the center island. With a surge of self-preservation, Hannah managed to get her muscles into motion. She darted for the side door with the exit sign. She heard the wet slap as the monster landed on the floor where she had been only seconds ago. She yanked hard on the doorknob of the wooden side door. It pulled open and she sighed in relief as she jumped through the opening. But she couldn't get all the way through. Something had her leg. She looked down in horror as the tentacle wrapped around her slim ankle. She pulled as hard as she could, getting leverage from the door jam with her other foot. The tentacle suckers undulated, almost snake-like, and started to work their way up her calf muscle. She saw another tentacle in the doorway seeking her flesh. A small barb rose from the translucent skin of the tentacle, slowly, dripping with a green, viscous fluid. Hannah kicked wildly in panic and broke free from the suckers that left small bruises on her leg. She turned and scrambled into the small service hall and ran right into a man. They both tumbled to the floor. We gotta go, she yelled as she heard the screech from the kitchen. Come on now, relax, you're okay, the man said, helping her to her feet. He was strong. He wore a black suit with an aquamarine button-down shirt. His black hair was slicked back to just about shoulder length. His bright green eyes entrapped her for a second. In that second, the monster went away. All pain went away. The world only consisted of this man. Now tell me, what is all the fuss about? He asked, stroking her hair. She practically melted from his touch. This man was her world now. The monster, she said, suddenly remembering and turning in his arms. The creature stood ten feet from them, its tentacles flailing, but not approaching any closer. The spawn of Cetus will not harm you, the man said, and Hannah felt her worry fade. No harm will come to you, if you play along. Play along, she said. I have come here to find a bride, and I'm sorry if the spawn of Cetus frightened you. He can be a little overzealous in his wishes to please me, the man said. That thing works for you? She said. In a sense, yes, he replied. Revulsion took a hold of Hannah, and she tried to push away from the man, but his strong arms held her tight. She remembered the knife in her hand and thought about plunging it into the man's ribs. Would that do the trick? She wondered. What say you? Would you like to go home with me and be my queen? The man asked and held her out at arm's length looking into her eyes. I have a choice? She asked. Of course you do, he said with a laugh. Free will is very important. Look, I I just met you. Don't you think we should have a date first, maybe? See if we have any common interests? Hannah said while looking for an escape route. You would deny me? He asked, raising an eyebrow. Well, you would have to at least meet my parents first, she quipped and gave him a half-smile. She saw the rage start to consume his face. You jest at Pontus, the man said. This is a one-time offer. Take it seriously, he said angrily. The creature took a step towards her, screeching. Let me go, she said. You refuse your better? 
This is why your world is doomed, mortal, he said, shaking his head. But he still didn't let go. Maybe you think yourself above the queen of the sea. Maybe I should teach you a lesson in humility, he said, and nodded towards the creature who began to move forward, its tentacles grasping Hannah's ankles. With a quick tug, it pulled her from her feet, and she hit her head on the floor of the hallway, passing out. When she awoke, she was in a dark place, like a basement or cave. The stone wall didn't look like brick, but carved. She was laying on a slab of stone, held down by two of the spawn of Cetus's tentacles. The other two were still wrapped around her ankles. Shadows danced on the low stone ceiling, as she realized the light was reflected from moving water nearby. The smell of salt assaulted her nostrils. Good, you're awake. Much like the land animal, the horse that I hear about, maybe your spirit needs to be broken, Pontus said, and raised his arm to the creature and nodded. He stepped back into the shadow behind her until she couldn't see him anymore. The tentacles of the creature wrapped around her calf muscles and worked their way around, rising up her legs. She screamed and struggled against the bonds that held her, but they were solid. The undulating tentacles weren't a bad sensation. It was like a massage, only from a cold, clammy source. The part that bothered her more was where were they heading? She tried to lock her legs tight together as another foot of tentacle crawled its way up her, drawing the creature ever closer. The eyeless face stared back at her, not just blank of sight, but of emotion as well. Its beak was parted slightly as she saw the teeth inside, just in front of its tongue. The creature was only a few feet from Hannah now, and that's when she noticed something horrific. It wasn't the tentacles she had to worry about. A protruding mass of transparent flesh was growing between the squat legs of the creature. She screamed. The tentacles that were holding her legs suddenly pulled in opposite directions, spreading her legs wide. She cried out in pain of muscles and tendons not made to stretch that far as the creature made its way onto the table. She pulled against the tentacles holding her legs apart as hard as she could, but she couldn't budge them more than a few inches. The beast was too strong. That's when she noticed the knife laying on the slab next to her. It was only a few inches from her hand, as if Pontus didn't consider it a threat. She reached, spreading her fingers to gain another inch. She could touch the handle, but not enough to bring it to her hand. It wobbled from her touch. She tried to adjust her shoulder so that she could gain an inch or so, lowering her left shoulder down. That helped, and the top inch of her finger could touch the handle. She worked it back and forth, each wiggle gaining a fraction of an inch as the monster now kneeled between her legs with its impossibly huge appendage dangerously close to her. Nowhere was Pontus. The darkness surrounding her had swallowed him up. She couldn't see or hear him, as she struggled against her bonds and her slimy, supernatural rapist. Only a little more, and she could grasp the knife. Hannah felt the cold, slimy member strike her mid-thigh, and a whole new level of terror enveloped her. She nearly convulsed in elation when her fingers grasped solidly the plastic handle of the nine-inch knife. Quickly, she spun it around and slid the blade between her forearm and the creature's tentacles. With a push, the razor-sharp knife slid through the soft flesh, severing the limb and freeing her arm. A screech erupted from its beak. The sheer loudness made her cringe. She twisted quickly and freed her other arm with another swipe of the blade. Clear, thick fluid escaped the wounds on both tentacles of the monster. She sat up and plunged the steel into the monster's member with a two-handed thrust. The spawn of Cetus reeled back from the pain and slid off the table, taking the knife with it. Hannah quickly jumped to her feet and pulled her skirt down, relieved that the monster never finished what it set out to do. From this point of view, she could see that they were indeed in a cave. Salty seawater reflected light from a small opening at the far end of the cave about thirty feet away. She ran around the stone slab and looked for the knife in the pile of writhing tentacles, 
a quick glint from the light betrayed its presence, and she grasped it once again. She stabbed down into the face of the monster repeatedly, plunging all the way to the handle in its spongy, translucent flesh. The cold, clear fluid sprayed across her face with each strike dripping from her chin. Hannah didn't stop stabbing until the monster stopped moving. She caught her breath and stood over the corpse of the atrocity. Her eyes panned the cave's shadows for Pontus, but he wasn't to be seen. With tears on her cheeks, she limped her way to the source of the light. The opening was four feet across and just at the water's surface. She crawled onto the smooth stone, worn from eons of tidal erosion, and slipped into the light. She was on a rocky coast, the ocean's expanse in front of her. To the right and left, it looked like more rocks and cliffs with no discernible escape route. Hannah laid there for a few moments, basking in the warmth of the sun about 15 feet from the cave entrance, trying to get her bearings. She had to get a better view of the coast to see which way to go, and the only way to do that was to swim out a little from the rocks. She clutched the knife tight in her hand and dove into the cold waters. Fifty feet from the shore, she could make out a sandy beach section to her left and began to swim towards it. Her eyes kept darting back to that cave entrance, looking for any sign of the creature or Pontus, but she saw nothing as she made her way through the waves to the beach ahead. Once on dry land, she rested and looked herself over for wounds. Some minor cuts and scrapes, but nothing too bad. She tucked the knife into the belt on her skirt and headed towards the stand of trees in front of her. Suddenly, she heard a loud roar from the water. She spun on her bare feet and saw Pontus rising from the water about a hundred feet out. He rose like he was on an elevator to the surface and hovered over the water, accelerating towards her. Hannah screamed and ran into the forest, pushing small branches out of her way. She heard him hit land as the wake he made crashed against the beach. You cannot win, Pontus said in a booming voice. Hannah pushed through the thick underbrush in a near-blind panic, only trying to flee from the mad water god behind her. She nearly tumbled when the trees stopped, and she realized she was at a bay on the island. A wrecked pirate ship lay washed up on the beach. With a quick look over her shoulder, she dashed for the relative safety of the ship. Scrawled in white paint on the side of the hull was the name, Poseidon's Vengeance. She entered the captain's chambers just as she heard a crack and a thud from the forest line. Pontus emerged behind the fallen trees. Enough of these games, bitch, he called out with a sneer. No longer did he have mesmerizing eyes as she watched him through the broken portside window. Pontus scanned the nearby area for her. Hiding will do you no good. I have all time, Pontus said, walking towards the wreckage. Hannah looked at the knife at her belt and knew it would be useless against Pontus. She looked around the cabin for a better weapon. Hanging on the wall above the rotted mattress was a large trident. She jumped up and grabbed it with both hands, yanking it free from its resting place. There were words inscribed down the heavy metal shaft. The Earth Shaker. Hannah gripped the weapon in both hands as she heard Pontus step onto the worn wooden planks of the pirate ship. She knew it was useless to hide. He would find her. She mustered up all the courage she could and headed towards the doorway, trident first. Pontus was on deck, about thirty feet from her. He stood there, full of confidence, looking at her with victory in his eyes. Your insolence will not go unpunished, wife. But we have a long time to break you in, he said. Now drop that mortal weapon and bow to me. Hannah stood her ground, staring back into the eyes of the primordial god. She shifted her grip on the haft of the weapon, turning it in her hands. Pontus reacted immediately, eyes growing huge. Where did you find that? It can't be, he said, first taking a step forward, then one back, as if indecisive. Captain's quarters, she said, taking a step forward. 
She watched amazingly as Pontus took a step back towards the end of the ship. You don't know what you're messing with, the sea god said, keeping his distance from her. Hannah looked down at the haft, the earth shaker. The words rang out in her mind. The phrase sounded so familiar. Stay back, she said, hoping to sound stronger than she felt. It was a wonder her hands weren't shaking. This is your last chance. Put the trident down, Pontus said. Hannah gripped the haft and raised it, pointing the metal-tipped barbs at Pontus threateningly. I said, stay back, she said. Pontus took a step forward and smiled. You don't know what you have there, do you, little one, he said, the confidence back in his voice. I'm going to stab you with this sea fork, she quipped, raising it above her head. The weapon was heavier than she thought, and her arms began to wobble. You're too weak to be my bride. I will have to find another, Pontus said, and stepped closer. The weight of the trident was too much after everything she'd been through, and it started to slip from her hands. She brought her arms down, and gravity pulled the three tips down into the deck of the ship. The sound of metal entering wood was deafening, and the force made Hannah fall on her seat. But what it did to Pontus was the most exciting. The sea god was knocked clear over the side of the ship and out of sight of Hannah. Tremors started almost immediately and she could see the trees on the beach shake with the fury of each one. She rose to her feet carefully, using the old sea-soaked wood of the ship as a brace against the impact. She made her way to the rail and looked for Pontus. She saw the sea god rise to his feet, his eyes all but aglow with hatred aimed at her. He stepped back towards the ship in the ankle-deep water, but one step was all he took. The ground shook harder, and Hannah had to hold onto the rail to keep herself upright. The water under Pontus quickly disappeared, and then the sand began to as well. The sea god looked down in surprise as a chasm began to open up beneath him. He quickly jumped backwards to the edge, trying to remain on solid ground. The opening spasmed, and a wall of water erupted and began to spin around Pontus. You can't take me! Don't you know who I am? He called out to the sky with hands stretched out. Hannah turned towards the trident, still buried in the deck of the ship. The Earth Shaker, she said. Another nickname for Poseidon. The ship was called Poseidon's Revenge. She realized how it sounded familiar, as image from Myth and Legends class came back to her. Hannah fought against the shaking and made her way to the trident, gripping it with both hands to keep her balance. Pontus was screaming now, barely audible over the sound of rushing water that was forming a cyclone around him, the force of which was raising him above the earth. Hannah could now see the angry sea god looking at her over the rail of the ship. He struggled against the water, but didn't seem to be making any headway. She rose to her full height as the tremors stopped shaking the ship. A large man-shape made of water rose next to the cyclone, a sea-foam beard adorning its face. Hannah looked on in awe at the beings in front of her. This new entity turned towards her. She pulled the trident out of the deck and tossed it towards the watery being who grabbed it out of the air. It spun around and launched the trident directly into the chest of Pontus. The imprisoned sea god let out a blood-curdling scream as the trident pierced his body, nearly tearing him in two from the force. The cyclone suddenly stopped, and Pontus was dropped straight into the chasm below, disappearing from view. The watery figure turned towards Hannah and gave her a quick bow before splashing down into regular water. Wait, she called out, looking over the side of the ship for her savior. I want to thank you. There was no response, just the churning of the tidal waters around the wreck of the pirate ship. Hannah sighed and slumped down on the ancient deck. She must have fell asleep because the next thing she noticed, it was dark. She climbed off the ship, taking some of the old wooden planks with her. It took her some time to create a fire on the beach, but eventually she managed to get it alight with some friction. The warmth felt good. An hour later, a spotlight fell on her as a Coast Guard helicopter flew overhead. She was saved. She looked out over the moonlit water 
and thanked her protector, Poseidon. It took a little while for them to send down the rescue basket, but soon enough, she was safely on board and flying home. She vowed never to step into the ocean again. The High Beam Initiation by Rob Fields It's Friday night, and I'm sitting in the back seat of a Ford Mustang as we're driving down a nearly deserted country road. As it turns out, I'm a pledge for the Sigma Kappa Beta fraternity. But wait, I'm a girl. You might be asking, shouldn't I be pledging a sorority? As it turns out, Strickfield University has all-male fraternities, all-female sororities, and a few co-ed fraternities. I've been told the Sigmas are one of the top fraternities to be a member of. I've been pledging this fraternity for a while now. While we do have fun, even as pledges, we've had to do a select few choice things. Things we're not supposed to talk about. This car ride tonight is one of them. I'm sitting in between Blaine Nelson and Constance Vanderbilt, the two co-heads of this fraternity. Looking at us, you'd swear we were part of some rich people club. We're expected to wear our polo shirts, skirts for girls and trousers for guys, and loafers with socks. We even have ascots around our necks. Since we're supposed to be prominent members of both the university and of society, we're expected to conduct ourselves as such. I glance over my shoulder and see the other car following behind us, a Dodge Charger. Then I look ahead again. Constance takes hold of my hand. Don't worry, love. It won't be that bad once it's your initiation. Tonight, we're going to see what William Hartley will be doing, and what the few others before him did, and you next Friday. Blaine adds. We drive down the road for a little while longer, then I notice it gets darker behind me. I look over my shoulder and see that the charger now has its headlights off. I turn back around and am about to ask about that, but I notice that the lights are off now in this car, too. It's all part of the initiation, Blaine tells me. Nothing to worry about. Constance still holds my hand. Don't be scared. I try to relax and just enjoy the ride. We're coming to a long stretch of straight road after a series of curves. Just ahead, a car comes towards us. We have a possibility, Blaine kind of sings quietly. I'm about to ask him what he means, but then the car ahead of us flashes their brights. Normally, that's what people do when they want you to know you don't have your headlights on after dark. Constance squeezes my hand a little. Get ready. After we pass the car, we suddenly screech into a hard turn, like in the movies. As we straighten and pursue the car that flashed us, the charger also turns around and again follows behind us. Carson Van Horn, our driver, looks in the rearview mirror. Yeah, it's her all right. We got her. We hit the gas. Now we move into the opposite lane and are soon next to the flashing car. I look to see who's driving. It's still too dark to see who's inside, but it does look like a girl based on her long hair. Carson honks the horn, one blare after another, then it's one continuous blare. The flashing car tries to speed away, but it's no match for this Mustang. We speed up and soon drive past it. Suddenly, Carson hits the brakes and swerves in front of the other car. The other car brakes suddenly and swerves off the road. The charger moves and stops right next to the passenger side door. I wonder why. I guess I'll soon find out. Constance pats my head. Showtime, Caprice. Time to see how your initiation will be next Friday night. We get out of our cars. The girl gets out of her car. She turns to run, and then something just tears the night air. Was that a gun? The girl cries out, then she slams hard against her open door and tumbles over it. We all move over to the girl. All I can do is feel my heart pounding rapidly. Did somebody really shoot her? Good job, William, I hear Donna Blossom chime. Now finish the bitch. The girl whimpers in pain as we close in on her. I still can't see her face fully, because there isn't much light. Also, the moon's not full. She tries to stand up, but William raises his pistol and shoots her again. The girl screams loudly. William steps up to her and shoots her once more. In the stomach. 
She groans and forces herself to sit up. Then she screams at us in defiance. You'll be fucking sorry, all of you. Constance lets go of my hand. Then she and Blaine lower themselves. No, bitch, Constance murmurs. You were the one who fucked up. You never challenge the Sigmas. Blaine chuckles. Yeah, calling the police on us for last Friday night's initiation? Seriously? Constance spits in the girl's face. You got our pledge expelled, you stupid cunt. We simply can't let that stand, can we? Go ahead, William, Blaine tells him. It's your show. William lashes out with his foot and kicks the girl in the face to send her full on her back. Then he aims his pistol and empties the rest into her face. I want to gasp and faint, but I'm too paralyzed right now. The full sigmas gather around William and congratulate him. I don't really hear what they're saying. Did this really happen? A girl is killed in a cold-blooded initiation? It's almost like we did the gang ritual or some shit. I mean, I know our co-ed fraternity has issues with certain people on our campus, but did it have to come to this? Christ, my heart won't stop pounding. Donna grabs William and sucks face with him. Then I look up again and hear the others cheering Donna and William on. Then they get on the ground and start fucking right next to the girl's body. You're one of us, honey, Donna cheers to William. You're a full Sigma now. Yeah, Blaine assures him. Now you'll truly reap the benefits of being a Sigma. I lower myself and use my smartphone camera light on the body. Then I see the tattoo on the girl's inner right wrist. It looks like a figure eight ribbon, but blue. I quickly stand up and move to the girl's car. Where are you going? Constance calls to me. We have to get rid of the evidence, right? I call back. I'm getting the girl's purse. Good call. I get in the girl's car. Her purse is sitting in the passenger side. I yank it over to me and pull out her wallet. Using my smartphone camera light, I learn whom William just killed. My eyes grow wide when I see it was Melody Carlisle. I fucking know this girl. She was a co-chair of an organization that operates on our campus. I can't say which one. Once the other co-chair, her fraternal twin sister Katie, learns of Melody's death, there's going to be some serious fucking hell to pay. I guarantee it. It's Friday again, and my initiation into the Sigmas is tonight. I've managed to do everything in my power to keep both my composure and a straight face. Even when I find myself walking past Melody's friends, I have to really give it my all to keep from going batshit crazy. Oh, those girls give me dirty looks. You know what I'm talking about. In fact, I'm in the restroom over at Kendall Hall when I finally realize that I've made a critical mistake. I'm alone without a Sigma brother or sister. Suddenly, I hear the door being pulled shut. I turn to see Katie Carlisle and two other girls beside her. No doubt, there are one or two more standing outside, keeping people out. There's nowhere to run. Katie Carlisle is on me just like that. She backs me up against a wall and presses a hand over my shoulder to hold me there. Then she glares into my eyes and gives me a deadly smile. Her always purring, whispering voice cuts me to the bone. You were there last Friday night, Caprice. You didn't kill Melody, but you were there. I, I, I had no idea, I stammer. You're the only pledge, so why would you? Katie shakes her head slowly. And killing you isn't an option. I would never allow that. You need to make this right. But, but, I sputter. Katie leans in and gently brushes her lips to mine, and pecks them. If you don't, you'll have so much to lose. All you've worked for, you'll have just pissed away. It doesn't have to be this way. You're not initiated, Sigma, yet. You still have time to do the right thing. I'll go to the police, I stammer. You can but you'll still lose everything. 
Katie's face is still dangerously close to mine. And the police can't protect you. Not from us. If you really want to make things right with yourself, with me, the two other girls gather in. There's no way out of this. It's Friday night now. It's my turn to become a full Sigma initiate. As with last Friday night, I'm sitting in between Blaine and Constance in the back of Carson's Mustang. Don't worry, love, Constance assures me. As before, she's holding and caressing my hand. I've been conditioning you all week. You've got this. I'll be okay, I assure her. Blaine hands me the semi-automatic pistol. Not the same one William used. Here you go. It's fully locked and loaded. I take my hand back from Constance and cradle the pistol, which feels very heavy. I caress it and know that this piece of hot metal is the key to unlocking my whole future. Once I complete my initiation, the world is my oyster. The Sigma's got intel that Katie Carlisle herself is going to be my target. She's supposed to be heading down this county road that we're turning onto right now. Supposedly, she takes this road when she wants to go home and visit her family. Remember, Katie and Melody are both high-profile girls on our campus. Amazing, huh? As Sigmas, we're supposed to be doing stupid shit like keggers and charity drives, but that's only a cover. Turns out that a select few fraternities and sororities are into way more than just academics. The Sigmas want to be tops, so they eliminate their rivals. I've dulled my emotions from what happened last Friday night. Just seeing William soaking it up as a full Sigma brother since he completed his initiation. He's sucking face with Donna in the front seat as she sits on his lap. He throws himself around now, just like the rest of the Sigmas. I sigh to myself. Just a little while longer. Soon... We see the lights of an oncoming car. This has to be our target. This has to be Katie Carlisle coming. Soon, so very soon, I'm going to solidify my destiny. I'm going to complete my initiation. No one and nothing will stop me. The headlights on both the Sigma vehicles are out. The oncoming car is approaching quicker. Then, the headlights flash. And again... After passing the car, Carson slams on the brakes and turns the Mustang sharply. The Charger follows suit once we're in pursuit. Carson floors the gas and quickly gets us within close proximity of what should be our... My... Conquest. As with Melody Carlisle, we get this other car pulled over. The Charger pulls up next to the passenger door, which I understand is to block it to keep a victim from escaping that way. We get out of the Mustang and walk to the other car to see that Katie Carlisle is indeed sitting behind the wheel. I raise my pistol and aim it right at her. You picked the wrong fucking night to be out driving, you stupid bitch, I say to her. The moon is full tonight. Katie looks right at me and purrs back. Did I? Bitch, don't you understand what's going on here? I demand sharply. You and your bitches cross the Sigmas way too many times. You don't seem to understand that we do whatever the fuck we want without a fucking care in the world, without mercy. You should have just stayed on campus. Katie laughs. But if I did that, she even has the balls to get out of her car. If I did that, I'd miss your initiation. And that certainly is not an option. She steps right up to me. I want to stare deep into your eyes as you use that gun and complete your initiation. And stare deep into my eyes, she does. Katie's not the least bit afraid, and believe me, I haven't forgotten what she said to me when I was cornered in the restroom earlier this afternoon. I put the barrel of the pistol right in between her always exposed cleavage, right on her fucking heart. She stretches her arms out wide, You ready to complete your initiation, Caprice? I'm right here. She's still looking deep into my eyes. Do it. I immediately lock my emotions away and focus. It's initiation time. No backing out now. 
With lightning speed, I pull the pistol away from Katie. I turn, take quick aim at William, and fire two shots. The first bullet goes right between his eyes. The second one goes into his heart. The motherfucker is dead before he hits the ground. As Donna reacts, I raise my pistol and repeat the shots. The bitch is also dead before she hits the ground. The rest of the Sigmas give me a bewildered look. I raise my pistol to fire again, this time at Constance, but Katie stops me. No, you've completed your initiation, Caprice. You're officially one of us now. What the fuck is this? Carson yells. Caprice here was tapped long ago by our organization, Katie tells them. You see, we know you've been killing off people on campus for a while now. But when you killed my sister, you crossed a line you never cross with us. After talking to Caprice this afternoon, we knew she was a perfect fit. She always was. You fucking cunt! Constance yells at me. Katie looks her way. Before you so harshly judge her, you have to understand something about Caprice. She was never going to be a Sigma. There was no way we'd ever let her. Katie turns me to face her. Welcome, my new sister. You're a blue ribbon now. Katie then wraps her arms around me and draws me in for a deep, passionate kiss. When we stop, we turn to face the still bewildered Sigmas. Constance is confused. Blue ribbon? I lifted up my polo shirt and Katie undoes a shoulder strap on her top. We use our smartphone lights to show our matching blue ribbon tattoos above our left breasts. Katie explains. The blue ribbons are what you would call a secret society. Our main purpose is to groom individuals to help control. How do you think people from our types of organizations get into our government and help keep it corrupt? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry, but I never said I was the hero of this story. Katie's the love of my life, I explain. Turns out, we had a huge fight months ago. I left the blue ribbons while I was training under them. I wasn't thinking straight when I let you people talk me into pledging Sigma. And when you killed Melody, Katie's twin sister, I felt I was as good as dead. I would never have let you go that easily, baby, Katie purrs. I love you. We have too much history together. She glares at the Sigmas now. And speaking of history, as if on cue, the doors to the Charger open. The Sigmas are surprised to see all the girls getting out of the car. All blue ribbons. Oh, we took care of the rest of your fellow Sigmas earlier, Katie explains. The other blue ribbons gather around what's now left of the Sigmas. Caprice has completed her initiation. And is officially one of us now, ladies, Katie announces. The rest of these Sigma fuckers are yours. Kill them however you like. You, you won't get away with this, Blaine yells. Uh, but we will, I tell them. Yeah, a few cars have passed by and probably saw what was going on, but they didn't see our faces. Too dark for that, even with the full moon. And we're way better than you Sigmas at covering up evidence. Once you're all dead, there will likely be an investigation. Katie continues. All people are going to know about your initiations is what we decide to spread around. We'll create a new local lore around Strickfield. People will soon come to call this legend the Gang High Beam Initiation. Katie and I both watch with glee as the Sigmas are cut down. The Sigmas at Strickfield University no longer exist, and as far as you're concerned, neither do the Blue Ribbons. And this initiation night has come to the end.